<clears throat> let's uh let's check this thing out. Begin. Where's bang the machine? Somebody say bang the machine? You guys have actually seen that? Killer Instinct. The name alone evokes nostalgia. For some, it may be of the crowded and loud arcades of the 90s. For others, it's of late nights huddled around the TV with either a SNES or N64 controller in hand. But for many, it's memories of bringing a new console home to discover a killer surprise. Killer Instinct is a series with a history that spans decades and a style that has allowed it to stand apart from its contemporaries. And even though it's been seven years since its latest iteration, the fire for KI still burns bright today. For the past few months, I've traveled around the country to talk to the developers behind Killer Instinct, as well as the community that calls it home, to learn about how and why a game like KI holds a special place in so many hearts. And our story starts with a dream and some rare talent. I've seen this place before. I might be... I... I'm... I might be... Uh... I might be pausing this every once in a while to talk about some of the stuff that's that went on with KI chat. So, just to let you know, I might be. I might be pausing it every once in a while. In the late 70s through 82-ish, arcades were massive in America. They were everywhere. And I got in the game industry, but I was playing at Sunnyvale Golfland the whole time. And I was very enamored early on with the Neo Geo. So I was thinking about creating games all the time, because that's what I did. And I had a dream to make a fighting game. I had this idea of, I want to do bigger combos, and I want to have a resolution to big combos. These were driven actually from a few things. This is long before I even met Rare. There's a character in World Heroes called Dragon, and he had a very simple Dragon. one hit move he could do that was elbow, and then he'd come up with a fist. Literally, that's where auto doubles came from. The idea that I could push a button and get two hits, but it's like, but I don't really want to do that the way that game does, because it's, you could literally just start a combo like that. But what I liked about World Heroes was I could put that after certain strong hits, specifically jump in. That was where open, auto, double, and finisher came from. So jump ahead, Kim Kapwan and the Neo Geo games had big moves you could do when you had the full life bar. He had an ultra combo and he'd do like a 12 hit, yeah, that, 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 you know, and it's <laughs> like that, I want that. This is the beginnings of Killer Instinct. The dragon character and Kim Kapwan doing that move started me thinking about this idea of maybe you should be able to do longer combos in a fight. If you're gonna do that, what I didn't like about any game where you were getting hit more than three or four times was as a player, I felt like you're hitting me, I'm gonna watch, gee thanks. That's where Combo Breaker came from. So all that I had formulated while I was at Namco. Wasn't starting a game at the time, I end up signing a fighting game, funny enough, called Melee. Hired James Goddard, this fighting guy I knew from, from Sunnyvale Golfland, to come and help with this Melee design. Then I get the call to go to Nintendo. So I... Confirmed. Ken Lobb also made Melee. I sort of flushed the Melee design from my head, because it's like, like, I can't take that. But I'd still been fixated on this idea of open auto double and finisher combo breaker. Literally weeks after I started Nintendo, I fly to Japan, I meet Tim and Chris Stamper, I get shown Donkey Kong Country, we sign it. My job in the first few months at Nintendo was literally go to Rare, figure out exactly what hardware they need to build this Donkey Kong Country thing, and find out how much it costs, hardware, software. It was more than Japan kind of wanted to spend. These were the Their old SGI machines. Don't spend it. Their answer was, okay, we should maybe sign them to do three games. So I go to Rare knowing that I'm going to give them everything they need to do Donkey Kong. We'd already signed. But that maybe there are more games. They'd been told, you know, hey, maybe you could do a couple more games. So they sit me down in a room with three of them, and they're like, here's the second game we'd like to do. And funny enough, the name was Brute Force. Brute Force. Brute Force was not Street Fighter. It was not Mortal Kombat. And it was definitely not Killer Instinct. They were going after a little Street Fighter and a little Mortal Kombat, but no combos. Damn, look at, look at Wanda's costume. Holy hell. They liked two-in-ones, and they liked kill moves. And I sat down literally in that, like 20 minutes in, I'm like, I got an idea. And I drafted out open, auto double, end finisher, combo breaker, ultra combo. Explained all those. Explained the way a combo actually works, because they'd never built a fighting game. Long story short, 
uh, I leave and come back to America, and less than two weeks later, Howard Lincoln comes into my office. Joel Hochberg called. He was the president of Rare at the time. They want you to go back and talk more about that fighting game. So I went back for a full week. We laid out the whole kind of idea of what this game should be. Come back about a month and a half later. They'd done motion capture. They had the first early beginnings of Jago, and I worked with them to build Jago's first combo. And so we just wanted to build, what does this feel like? Does the code work to run this? I had also been fixated on the best fighting games had these very succinct, psh, 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 this kind of multi-layered sound effect that made a punch sound cooler than a punch. Let's do that better. They had a few variants. They plugged it into that first combo. And I get this call late in the afternoon, which means it's like 2 o'clock in the morning at Rare. You got to hear this. I mean, that's literally the call. You got to hear this. And they put it down. <laughs> you know that new sound you've been looking for? Listen to this. What <laughs> are <laughs> it's Jayco doing the what are you and the kicking <laughs> and they're like we believe they they had kind of understood what I wanted and you know they believed it enough to go try this prototype but it was literally interestingly it was the hearing of the combo that pushed them over and got them like shall, shall we say completely bought in and again I want to make it perfectly clear I walked in with a bunch of cool ideas that I was thinking about this team at Rare built Killer Instinct. I would help and go build every character, almost all. There were a couple that I didn't travel for. I formed a team back at Nintendo inside the treehouse, specifically of every fighting game lover that I could find at Nintendo. So that was sort of the gig after that. Go to Rare, build a character, come back, test it, balance it against Jago, go back, build the next character, back and forth, back and forth. The guy that hired me into Nintendo was Tony Harmon. He, was, he left Nintendo a few years after I came. He's the one that came into my office one day, and he's like, I think I have a good name. We should call it Killer Instinct. And I'm just like, uh, yes, but there's no way we're going to be allowed to call it that. And he's like, this oh, is Nintendo. I would like the name. Okay. <laughs> so, and then my next... Now you got to realize how 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 much of a precedent that is like at the time with nintendo howard lincoln and his his sort of culture that he was building around nintendo in the 90s was super pc like disney levels of even more than what was going on right now so the, the fact that like noa specifically was okay with them calling it killer instinct and having nintendo as a logo on there, they were like very family friendly, like even more so than kind of what Nintendo even is now. Next was, but there's no way that's gonna pass trademark search. And he's like, we already started. So we're, we've done the quick worldwide, it passed. So what do you think? And I'm like, oh, yes. And you know, let me go talk to Rare. They had the same response. It's kind of like, we get to call it that? Yes, yes please. <laughs> and anyway, we end up with the name Killer Instinct. Available for your home in 1995, only on Nintendo Ultra 64. Killer Instinct. Killer Instinct, believe it or not, was my first competitive. Ignore everything this guy says, never believe a word that comes out of his mouth. Fighting game. It was the first fighting game that I got in my hands and I was like, I want to be really good at this. I got a player's guide, uh, the old Super Nintendo player's guide that was actually, I believe you can mail in for free. So it was one of the most popular like strategy guides back in the mid 90s. And once the game came out on Super Nintendo, I was all in. Um, I was very young at the time, like I was probably 11 or 12 years old. But after playing that game in arcades, it was truly the greatest looking video game you'd ever seen. No one knew if it was like CG because the term CG didn't really exist back then. Like digital graphics had only gotten so far. Everyone thought it was claymation. No one could figure out what they did to make this game look the way it does. They were using SGI's to render a lot of these characters. To be clear, that the SGI is very, very high end graphics at the time. These are the same machines that was used to render Jurassic Park. Yeah, these machines that Kevin Bayless, who I'm gonna, sorry, I'm in, 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 injecting. Kevin Bayless was the original designer at Rare. 
and he was the guy that essentially made all the renders for KI and the character models, right? He also made Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong, like all of the classic Rare look that you know about Rare, from Killer Instinct to Donkey Kong to everything, came from these SGI machines, but these machines were insanely expensive. They had such little documentation of how to get them to work, but Kevin was able just to, he just worked on it forever. He just kept making stuff and eventually just came, came to the point where he was making these renders look really good. So much so that what Nintendo was pumping out and what Rare was pumping out in terms of their visuals to associate with their games was better looking than any game ever at in, in the mid 90s. Like this is 1994. Nothing looked like it, and it's because so few people actually knew how to use these machines, and they were so expensive. That is actually how they got famous. It's because of all the Hollywood special effects that they have created. This is the start of CG. And Rare adopted it. They did an amazing job, of course, first with Donkey Kong, and then they used that to render all these fighting game characters that are just amazing looking. You see all these amazing renders of all the characters from Rare. You'd see a mix of them from like a whole bunch of different genres. Like you'd see a werewolf that might be from Darkstalkers, but you also see a ninja. So it's like, oh, there's a bit of Mortal Kombat in there. And you just saw this really cool mix of characters. You saw a box, you saw an alien, you saw a dinosaur. And it was just a game that when I got to really, really see it, all the characters, all the artwork, all their special moves, I was like, I need to buy this game. Killer Instinct was unique when it first came out because when I was basically walking around the arcade, I didn't even know it existed until I just hear this big combo breaker. And I'm like, what what the hell is that, man? Like it's so loud. It was like way <laughs> louder than any other game in the entire arcade. And I just go over there and I see the owner, he's playing this character, throwing these projectiles and he's playing Fulgore. And I was like, dude, that that character looks so sick. And I was immediately drawn to to that franchise and I just started playing KI every day after school, before school maybe sometimes during school. Rare owned arcades. So they had a couple of arcades in Florida. They understood, you know, hey, we've got the best looking game. There's no one's gonna touch this. I mean, we were on millions and millions of dollars of hardware to make the sprites in Killer Instinct. So we kind of knew visually we were gonna be ahead. They wanted to make the machine loud, that you could hear it. But they wanted to do it in such a way, and you could say it was kind of sneaky, that the loudest things by a lot weren't gonna get heard on day one. Combo breaker, ultra combo. Those should be louder. The call-outs of combos should actually get louder. Oh, because people don't know how to do... Chat, you have to remember, this is arcades. There's no documentation and there's no internet. So nobody knows how to do things until people eventually are mashing the shit out of the buttons on the, on the arcade sticks in an arcade. Just shit just eventually happens. And then all of a sudden, combo breakers happen. And then suddenly, ultra combos happen. So by day one... Nothing, you, no, the game doesn't even seem that special. And they're, they're able to get away with these audio, the, these audio cheats that they're essentially putting into Killer Instinct because I have one of these cabinets. I actually have an original KI cabinet. I cannot make the volume go all the way up. I've only gone to 50%. If I, if I made the volume go all the way up, I would break fucking windows. So you get a three hit. Triple combo. You get the big combos, they're gonna be louder. <laughs> Combo. And if you get Ultra Combo... Ultra Combo! It's gonna be 40% louder. So a traditional person that buys an arcade machine, they go through setup, they... Button, turn it up a little, push the button. This thing. I've only gone to about here. I've only, on, on my, on my KI cap, I've gone to about here and I'm like, this is so fucking loud. This is so loud right now, and it goes up to here. Okay, that's as loud as it should be. <laughs> Not knowing <laughs> that as soon as somebody, ultra combo, that it was gonna be loud. And clearly within a few weeks, people started to learn those moves. So you walk into an arcade, and what was that? And then you go see this game that looks like nothing else. The art style was completely different. The combo structure was completely different. Cause Street Fighter was, was kind of limited in, in its interaction. You know, by that I mean, your combos were quick and concisive, as they're pretty short, but Killer Instinct just, it took that and just ran with it. So you're talking like 20, 30 hit combos and stuff. The first time I saw an infinite with Cinder, like I just freaked out. I'm just like, what am I watching here? what's going on? I'm like, but I want more of this. And so 
Cinder's got these infinites in this game where your character is not even on the screen anymore. You're like juggled up, but for some reason Cinder can keep hitting you and looping your ass. It's hilarious. I remember seeing somebody do that in the arcade. Huh? Oh, in, in the classic, in the classic hardware, yeah, he could like, it's so broken. Like, it's incredibly, and they actually made revisions later on that they manually had to go out to machines and update them with new chips. Like, it was, it, they, had to, they said they had to manually go out to like 20,000 plus machines and update them. Someone at Midway did or something like that, because Cinder was so broken. Stuff. Killer Instinct, especially at the time, was pretty groundbreaking because in all the other titles, it was a one-sided interaction. You got opened up, you're taking this damage regardless. In Killer Instinct, you were still playing even though you were taking hits. And as long as you were able to like identify the frames and you know get the timing right and you know hit the proper inputs, you could still break out of a bad situation. It took a while to actually understand the, the concept, but once you did, it opened up a whole new world of, of just interaction between players and stuff because it turned into a mind game that would happen like during the neutral into you know potential mind games that happened during an actual combo itself as well. So it just added that extra layer of, of complexity and depth and just fun interactivity between players and such, and that was that was awesome. The entire audaciousness of the machine, the cabinet, is what drew everyone in, how loud it was, how visceral it was, how violent it was, and by today's standards, it's not violent at all, but it did a lot to capture your attention between its music and its visuals and presentation, so much so that when it came out, I'm like, this is the game for me. <laughs> Killer Instinct's success would lead to various ports in an arcade sequel that would later come to the Nintendo 64 as KI Gold. This would be the last we'd see of the franchise for quite some time, however. Rare would go on to be purchased by Microsoft in 2002 for $375 million, becoming Jesus. a first-party developer for the Xbox. Character trademarks developed by Rare, such as Killer Instinct, were retained by the company. It would take close to a decade before signs of a Killer Instinct return would start to emerge. I made a YouTube video about this. I remember the day this happened, chat. I remember reading these articles and the day this happened in September of 2012 and just losing my mind. I invited Kenny and Steve over like the same week and we just played Killer Instinct 1 and 2 together on like an emulator or something because it was the only way to play it. Yeah, it was, it was, I couldn't believe what was happening. If, but we didn't know if it meant anything or not at the time. So what happened is at the time I was working as the creative director for XBLA, which if you remember for the Xbox 360 was all, we had this incredible digital library of games, right? But they were the games that only shipped digitally. Basically they didn't go to a box. They didn't, they didn't come out as a, like a big, huge, you know, like poster on the side of a bus kind of games. And I'd always loved fighting games. And so I'm sitting here in XBLA and I, I'm watching the whole portfolio come in and all these games that we're doing in all these different genres, but no fighting games. And so there was this one meeting we were walking out of that was a portfolio meeting. And me, as the gamer, turned to uh, Ted, who ran the organization. And I was like, shouldn't we have a fighting game in this portfolio? Like, we've got all these other genres covered. We have nothing for fighting. And, you know, most of the time with XBLA, we would let the games come to us. But this was one of those occasions that I was like, well, the game's probably not going to come to us. So what if we did it? And so I mentioned this to Ted. And Ted went, you need to talk to Ken Lobb. So I actually wanted to bring KI back. I ran XBLA for a few years. During that time, I wanted to bring KI back, but emulator, can't find a developer, problems. So we're about a year before the launch of Xbox One, and Adam Isgreen comes to me, hey, we should do Killer Instinct. Well, yeah, but there's problems. You don't have no developer, you know, none of the team is around. So I go talk to Ken. Obviously, you've already interviewed Ken, so you know that almost immediately Ken was like, okay, so here's how the combo system works, and blah, 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 and you can do this and that. And he goes into this whole history of Killer Instinct with me. That term, drinking from a fire hose, this was like having 17 fire hoses just pouring on you from every single angle, just like, oh my God, like all this Killer Instinct knowledge, ah! And I'm trying to absorb all of this. And then he's like, let's go to lunch. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we drive to his house, right? We get out of his car, we go into his house, and he's got a KI-2 machine. And he turns it on and then proceeds to beat me soundly for an hour while telling me constantly about why Killer Instincts is so great and all the cool things in it and all the neat things. And I'm like, whoa, okay, cool, awesome. After kind of getting all of this knowledge from Ken and getting Ken really excited about it, from there I just started really thinking about what we could do with Killer Instinct based on everything that I'd um, seen from Ken 
I went off, did a ton of research. I had an advantage, actually, in some respects, because I had some distance from Killer Instinct, that I was able to see some things that wouldn't hold up in a game if we were to bring it back today. I, I've heard this wonderful expression of Killer Instinct 1 being the best solo player fighting game ever because it was super fun and abusable, and yeah, playing multiplayer, you could kind of get in a situation, especially with characters like Cinder, where you're like, ah, I kind of just die, <laughs> right? Actually, I completely agree with that. I think Killer Instinct 1 is my favorite fighting games ever, but playing people, like actually fighting somebody else in KI1, kind of sucks. Like, and that's what he means. Like, Killer Instinct is actually a really fun game with a lot of interesting stuff per character, but when you actually play it, it doesn't make any sense, like, random hits do more damage than combos. The things that are really fun in the game don't technically, like, work well when you're fighting somebody else because you just end up doing unbreakable combos and shit. KI1's really good, and it was actually the first fighting game I played competitively, no joke. But I will completely agree with Retrospect that, no, no, KI, KI1 is the probably the best single-player fighting game in terms of just its core mechanics and messing around with it. And so I'm like, okay, well, we need to fix that. Like, how am I going to address that? And there's this wonderful little flowchart I came up with that kind of described the Killer Instinct combo system. But then I also added this thing to it called Repost, kind of diagrammed out what I thought would work for a modern version of Killer Instinct. And I wrote up this whole document on it, which we call an RFP, which is a request for proposal. And it's basically something that, like, Microsoft sends out saying, hey, we would like to make this video a video game. We would like it to be kind of like this, would you like to do this with us? And how much would you want money-wide, blah, 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 all the, all the legal stuff that would go into that. Of course, everyone's like, well, you got to talk to Rare, because, of course, this is their IP. And the cool thing is, is that Rare is an amazing bunch of people, and Craig Duncan, who runs it, is a great guy. And I sent him an email and said, hey, Craig, we're looking into, we're thinking about bringing back KI. Um, can I use KI? And I remember it was like, he wrote me back like three lines. And he said, yes, do the game justice by its fans, Make Ken Lobb happy. And he's like, so I've been told that I can go do it. I've, I've written part of an RFP. We have picked six developers that we think we're going to go approach. I went to Rare and asked, and their response was, well, if it's okay with Ken, because I'm the only one around from the original team. The people from Rare had literally all left. So he comes to me and he's like, I'm the gate? Me. Wasn't a big team. Yes. <laughs> yes, but. you know. So then that led to a bunch of conversations around, so here's what... I think Killer Instinct was, you know, and that should be part of the conversation in your RFP. But you want a developer that really understands fighting games because it's hard, right? It's not easy to just come from nothing and go build a fighting game. The funny thing is how we found Double Helix. Chris Charla, who of course you know now runs ID at Xbox. Anyway, one day Chris comes into my office and he drops this Xbox 360 game on my desk. And he's like, so I know these devs and I used to work with them and they're a really good group of guys and they have some good tech. You know, it's a licensed game. I don't know how good it is, but you know, you're looking for KI devs, and I thought, oh, maybe, you know, check it out. And the game was Green Lantern by Double Helix. And so I'm like, oh, okay. You know, the Brian Reynolds movie was pretty bad, but whatever, I'll check, you know, check the game out. And so I take the game home and I load it up, and I'm blown away by how good not only the animations are, the creativity on the combat system is pretty impressive, and all the effects look great. And I said to myself, I'm like, wow, this is a long shot, but then again, we're bringing back a 20-year-old franchise. This whole project is a long shot if we get to do it, right? Like, this whole thing is a long shot. You know, can we make this work? It's interesting, because I had started April 2012 here at Microsoft, and actually when the recruiter called me, I was going, okay, what is Microsoft doing that would involve me? Because I'm a combat guy and I do mostly violent stuff that involves punching things in the face digitally. So I was like, oh, maybe it's Killer Instinct, right? And then I thought about it, I was like, oh, well, they also have that other game, Rise. It's like this first person, like melee kind of sword game. Turned out it was Rise that I was being interviewed for. And I came on as the senior designer to basically direct and lead the combat. And then a couple months into that, Someone comes up to me and said, hey, you used to work at The Collective, right? I did. Oh, we're, we're dealing with Double Helix, so we're talking to them, and uh, you know, there's a discussion about Killer Instinct. Um, do you think that they can do it? Well, yeah, if they use the Slayer engine, they can absolutely do it. And the reason why I'm very passionate about that is because I worked at The Collective in 1999, and myself and some other people built the Slayer engine to be able to do Buffy the Vampire Slayer for original Xbox. And the scripting language and everything about what we did was based on my many years of doing fighting games before that and empowering designers. 
So I, I knew Double Helix could do it. They had the tools. Being an independent developer, you're always trying to like uh, line up your next project. At the time, I was actually working on pre-production for Strider. And we had a bunch of other projects that were going on at the time at the studio. And then an RFP came in and Patrick came to me. Patrick was our studio head at the time. And he goes, hey, Mike, Microsoft is looking for developers to work on Killer Instinct. And I was like, then we got to go do this. <laughs> There's no <laughs> question in my mind we have to put something together. When Berserker Mike, Michael Lett, approached me, kind of took me off to the side. And he's like, hey, would you want to work on a Killer Instinct? And I thought he was joking, you know, because I'm like, uh -huh, yeah, right, dude, whatever, and stuff like that. Because uh, cause he knows that, like, I'm a huge fighting game fan, um, like, as well as him and, like, uh, several other people on the team and stuff like that. And he rolls up, and he's just like I said, you know, you interested in, you know, working on a pitch for KI? And I'm like, you're, you're serious? He's like, yeah, dude. And I'm like, and, you know, like, everything just kind of stopped, and I'm like, <gasps> hell yeah, let's go. We'd send a pitch deck, and then we got a response back from Microsoft, and they're like, they showed some interest. They're like, hey, we want to know a little bit more about the studio and about what you guys are doing. So we finally got to have like an immediate on site with them, kind of just discuss what they were looking for. And we kind of got green lit into kind of a very early pre production period. And at that time, we basically had a whole bunch of new tech that we'd been working on. So we set up a gray box and basically replicated all of KI2 with like uh, two gray characters. <laughs> so they're, they're so completely cool. temp, so they're proxies, what we call them. Uh, and we put in the normal kind of golden path of the combat system in there. Our approach towards developing the prototype actually gave us really cool insights into actually how to approach the actual final game as well. We want to recreate Killer Instinct as accurately as possible or at least the systems involved accurately as possible in a short amount of time as possible. Because, you know, when you're a developer that's competing against other developers, you've got to do stuff, you know, quickly and timely. You don't have a extended amount of time. So that was one of the things we were trying to prove was like, we can get this done at a high quality in a short amount of time. I have literally looked at the first list and went, double helix? No, why are you going to double helix? And he's like, long story short, it's like, we want to give six people a try. They've done a couple of interesting things. Just, just hear us out. Fast forward a little bit. We got responses from a couple, man, we'd love to do this, but we're too busy. Iron Galaxy was one of those. They're like, if you wait six months, we would love to do this, please, please, please. And we're like, we got a launch coming. We think we might be able to hit a launch game. So I'm sorry, Iron Galaxy, but you're off the list. One team came back with a prototype. And even better, they came back with this letter, this sort of, you know, the dream of making a killer instinct. And that was Double Helix. And so I, I went from, why would we want them, their sixth, to playing this white box prototype and going, you know, they kind of get it. What I didn't know was Double Helix was collective. And I loved Buffy. I mean, Buffy is an interesting game. There was something designed in that game around combat circle, what it means to counter, when you counter, how many people are attacking you at the same time. That was very- I've never played this game before. What would it feel like to take I heard, I heard, it, I heard it was pretty good. Turn it into sort of a 3D final fight. Forgetting about the engine morphing from that Buffy, into no. Killer Instinct, the fact that that team understood what it why I wasn't interested in it, a complex brawler, to me, okay, they understand deep game mechanics that I didn't expect. It was like, okay, you guys know what you're doing. The thing that originally I think clinched it for Double Helix was the passion that they had. Every time we met them, you could sense it, it's it's a projection of love and of delight when you start talking about Ki, like. They, everything they said was always, oh my God, this and this, and we can do this, and it would be really exciting to do that, and how do we do that, and oh my gosh, this really cool thing, and we love what you're thinking about here, but what about this? And you could tell that this was more than just a job to them, this was something they really were hungry to do. And I think the studio at the time, Double Helix, was hungry to prove itself too, right? That like, hey, we can step up above, I'm not trying to disservice them by saying like B-tier games, but they were making a lot of games that would have you know, probably ended up on XBLA with some that go in the boxes, a lot of licensed games. But it's like, this is our shot at doing something great. And wow, did they take it. Like, they just took it and ran with it. They were just so passionate about it. And their tech was great. That was the other thing too. I mean, like, a combination of the passion, the knowledge of KI, and the engine that they were working with all was like, wow, maybe we can pull this off with them. 
With Double Helix and their Hex engine, an evolution of the Slayer engine used in previous titles, Microsoft had the developer and production began on the new Killer Instinct. Combined, there was a surplus development and testing talent involved that experience with fighting games or its community that would help bring this new KI to life. People like Campbell Tran, Filthy Rich, Dave Winstead, Rip, Maximilian, and many others. There was a lot of work to be done to bring the 90s fighter into modern times, and not much time to do it, as the team had only 10 months to get the game ready for the Xbox One's launch. Reviving Killer Instinct like, is presented Ooh. like a whole, a whole bunch of different dilemmas that we had to figure out in a short period of time. This was a title that we love. Like, we don't want to fuck this up. You know, this is one of those things. Not only that, but we want to do right by the community. We want to do right by, you know, the, the previous developers, you know, you know, by Rare and such. And we knew that this was going to be just a, a, an uphill battle, like across the board. This is going to be something that we were going to have to iterate on and, and solidify and crystallize and actually just figure out not just what Killer Instinct is as a whole, but what it could be. I think the big challenge was figuring out all the things that we could shed, right, without angering a lot of the fans, right? Because the other interesting thing about Killer Instinct is a lot of people played Killer Instinct, a ton of people did, but a lot of people played Killer Instinct 20 years ago. The strategy that, that myself and the team took was like, how do we capture the spirit of what was amazing about Killer Instinct? And a lot of people are saying, have I seen this before? I haven't, no, this is the first, uh, this is the first time I've actually seen this documentary. Things that people will remember in their heads, right? The bombastic announcer, the cool Jago, Orchid, you know, the characters that people remember, but do it in a way that we could make sense of it today. We came down to basically when you're designing characters, there's always like three key reads that you try to make sure are always uniquely identifiable components of that character. And especially when you're dealing with the characters that's existed before, you want to make sure that there's ties back to right. those things. That was so cool, like, because I was... Well, once KI was, like, revealed, I was going... And JJ knows this. I was going down to Double Helix on my own money. They were three hours away from where we lived in L.A. traffic. And I was going down there, like, two to three times a week. And to, to my absolute luck, I was invited, you know, initially, but I cared so much about KI and where they were going with this and was like, well, this game is so much fun. Like, I, I absolutely, like, I'm super into it. They pretty much had me come down and play test characters on the fly. Like, I, I, I remember being one of the first people to ever see Thunder. And they had, like, this big reveal thing and they just, like, wanted to see my reaction. It was so cool. Everyone loved KI so much, like, and I was, I was going down to this place, like, what was so far away. But I was driving to, like, essentially video game heaven, you know? Like, they were making Killer Instinct on one side of the building, and on the other side of the building, I was talking to Tony, who was the, the director on Strider. So, they were making Strider, and then I got hired from Capcom to make the Strider documentary. I made one of these, technically, for Strider, back in 2013, Chad. And on the other side of the building, Killer Instinct was being made, so I was hanging out with the Strider guys and trying out Strider before it was out. So I was so... You couldn't wait to tell me. Right? Yeah. And then I didn't know what Killer Instinct was, okay? Yeah. Truthfully. But you that this is the first time I've ever seen you shed a tear and cry of ha happiness for fighting game. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty and, special to me. Yeah, like you were you were in happy tears. I couldn't. I remember coming home the one day. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Like I lost I lost my shit. You did. I couldn't believe I couldn't believe like what we were like you once did. once we saw Thunder and everything, like and we once they showed me counterbreakers for the first time, I was just losing my mind. <laughs> couldn't believe it. So that people could still relate them. And for Fulgore, it came down to Oh my god, chat! The design of Fulgore! Oh, the... God! Uh, the, the design of Fulgore is a big one. I remember talking to the art director a whole bunch about Fulgore because he was going to be the last character added throughout the season. And they had a lot of very District 9 uh, looking Fulgore robot designs. And it was, it, was, it was much less what the Fulgore eventually came out and looked like. And I, I remember specifically the, the dude that was the art designer and Mike Willette uh, bringing me into this conversation about Fulgore before he was like, they, before he was actually chosen. This was like maybe around August or something, right? And this was, this was when we, we were first talking about doing trailers. 
So we started talking about uh, the full gore design. I'm not working for these guys, right? I'm not getting paid. I'm just this kid that is like, full gore is my number one character in the game. And they, they identify that, oh, Max really likes KI. Uh, see what he has to say about these full gore designs. So he let me in on the conversation with the art director where they had a lot of designs and they're like, let's let Max pick his like few ones, kid, right? Well, maybe not so much kid. I, f <laughs> I felt like a kid, sorry. <laughs> Um, and the one that they eventually did go with was the, the one that they used. Uh, I, I always felt Fulgore was kind of like a jet engine with legs. And that's pretty much exactly what they went with. The, 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 the design that Fulgore eventually had where it looks just enough like the old design, but still like modernized and sleek and cool. Like he looks like a, looks like a fighter jet with actual legs. I'm so... They went with the best Fulgore design they had, because some of the other ones were very out there. They were the very super robot -y in many ways. The arm blades, the ponytail, and I believe it was the chest plate were the three things that are like iconic must stay. Everything else is fair game to play with. And so we did all kinds of experiments and discovery to figure out what those things were with each character so that we could maintain them across the characters. We would take a really hard look at like the lore and the background for the character themselves and use that to draw inspiration for their moveset, their animations, their looks, like everything associated with the character. And some of the stuff on Spinal, you start to see some of that stuff. Like you see the shield that he has was actually a part of the ship. And then you start to see like all the elements that's actually hanging on him and everything. Like there's all sorts of details that kind of- I remember after making, sorry if I'm interrupting, after making this trailer for Spinal, yeah. Uh, this this is this is my trailer. After making the spinal trailer, I remember constantly getting the feedback from from everyone at like Double Helix, if not Microsoft. Yeah, let's let's do another trailer and let's make it as good as that spinal trailer. I'm like, okay, I'm like spinal is a very unique character because his background's incredible. He visually is the best looking character in Ki, and his music is revolutionary. Yeah. <laughs> his music is played with a human bone. I had, I had so much fun on Spinal's trailer, but the, the thing is, is that they're like, hey, let's just do another trailer like Spinal's trailer. I'm like, Ugh, okay, all right. Kind of call back to who this character is and everything like that. But on top of that, like, we start to look for little nuggets that you can actually just emphasize. Stuff that really, really called out to us was just how crazy the character was. Like, that cackle was, like, just a key moment for us. <laughs> So some of the stuff that we would start to mess with was like some of his poses, the way he would approach and like the style for his attacks and stuff like that where we wanted to make sure that they were very distinct. They're, they weren't like smooth and like, you know, Jago has a very smooth and clear and concise like move set and stuff like that. But he's just more like, I'm just a skeleton running at you, hitting with my sword, you know, like it's just, he's just crazy and over the top. And that's some of the stuff we wanted to, to focus on. Even um, Wes Fujiyama was, was the, one of the animators on that one. His kick, his heavy kick, is actually him running forward and then kicking the opponent in the junk. Like, <laughs> when Wes actually animated that, he put that in the game, and I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm like, we got to keep that. He's like, I don't know if they're going to go for it. And I'm like, shh, it's okay. Everything we put into the character's moveset has to work for this character. We just kind of use that to drive a lot of our creative process with regards to look, feel, and style for all the characters. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I mean, the other fun thing too was... Shout outs to Bao in the chat, who's one of our mods, <laughs> who's just talking. Yes, shout outs to Bao. John, do you remember the first day Sadira was playable? Oh my God. It was so much fun. She was so broken. <laughs> it was insane, dude. Everyone was picking Sadira and nobody could hit each other. She had so much uh, mobility. She had the snack attack. Oh, dude, it was insane. Like her, her, her aerial mobility. They're like, okay. After watching some people that were like a bit fighting game versed, and we start going in on each other. Like me and Rich were playing each other for like hours. They're like, all right, we gotta tone some of this shit down. <laughs> some of this stuff, definitely, we gotta bring it back a little bit. When you talk about the combo system itself, right off the bat, the combo system that we were working with originally we felt that was going to be too high a barrier of entry for standard players and stuff like, you know, standard FGC guys, like, yeah, they'll, they'll with some enough experimentation, they'll really pick it up and stuff like that. But at the same time, this is something that we want to bring this to a broader audience. And when you get to a certain point, mechanical barrier of entries 
is just, it's not really a valid thing because the people that are gonna spend the time on that will be able to pick it up. Like it'll become a muscle memory thing and just be able to jump into it. Whereas you're unnecessarily blocking other players, you know, more casual players or somebody that's new to the genre from being able to approach that tile because, because of that barrier of entry. So with the, one of the first things we wanted to do was try to figure out how to simplify that combo system while keeping the same rhythm, the same cadence, the actual combo structure itself and everything. Like, how do we make that happen nowadays? We had to go back and take a hard look at the combo system. And the interesting thing was, is in Killer Instinct 1, you could just kind of style, and the only thing you could break, right, were the linkers. And then in Killer Instinct 2, Killer Instinct 2 had absolute hard counters. So if you were doing a wind kick at me, and anywhere in that wind kick, if I yeah, did a laser weird. sword as a counter, I countered you. Like, you instantly got an advantage on me. And I'm like, this is the most broken fighting game system ever. We just had to really be honest with ourselves and think about, like, are people really gonna get that right now? There's a lot going on. I mean, Street Fighter Four was doing really well. And Street Fighter Four had loosened some things up, even with the, the way input systems worked. And so there was a lot of uh, modernization happening. And so this was one of the areas we absolutely had to deal with. And so Ken Lobb, to us, was the person that we had to talk to about this. We wanted Ken's blessing, especially because he was so tied to it. I mean, Rare trusted us with this IP. Ken was the best representative, not to mention the partner level creative director over the whole division and on KI. It was really cool that Ken trusted us to, to do that because we were able to look at it and just go, you know what, we gotta loosen this whole thing up. Like there were a whole bunch of things that just were dated. And the great thing is the Double Helix team kind of recognized that as well. And so we went through this iterative phase of figuring out, we went through like six or seven combo systems and eventually the Double Helix team even came up and we had been working on one internally, myself, James Goddard, um, another designer named Dan Fernacy, who does Rivals of Aether now. We even built one out of cards, which we actually took to the first Evo. That was all our prototypes. Who has these cards? I still got mine. Work. And Double Helix came up and we were going through pitches and then we're like, we, you know, we have a pitch. And we kind of did the whole pitch and noodled it back and forth with everyone from there and us and arrived finally at something that is the basic system from Killer Instinct Season 1 that then we evolved over time. The way I always explain KI to people who are brand new is that I say, the combos in KI are like sandwiches, right? Every sandwich has two pieces of bread. If it doesn't have two pieces of bread, well, first of all, you either got ripped off or it's like a really bad sandwich. You need two quality pieces of bread. And what kind of bread is up to you as well, right? There's lots of different ways that characters can open combos, which is the first piece of bread, and end combos, which is the bottom piece of bread. So you can have, you know, a high damaging opener, something like a nice sour dough. You can have something that's a little weak, you know, a little thin white bread that's barely hanging in there. You put a tomato in there, this thing melts, right? It's got like the moisture from it, it'll destroy this bread. So you got the bread, that's the opener and the ender. Then in the middle, you're gonna stack it with ingredients. And the way I always think about it is like, the meat of it is the normals you put in there. And then after that, you have the linker, these are special moves. That's like your veggies, right? So your lettuce, your tomato, you got anything in there, right? So when it goes back and forth, you don't want to just layer it all meat, all veggies. That's gross. Nobody does that. So you have to have like veggies, meat, veggies, meat, veggies, meat. And then it's so it. true. I do a normal of some it's kind. It's okay, I combos. Move of some kind, and a normal of some kind, special move of some kind. You got your meat, your veggies, your meat, your veggies, all the way down. And if you want to make the sandwich really small, really compact, easy to take a bite out of, that's great, but it doesn't fill you up that much, right? If you make it bigger, a big, fat, heavy sandwich like this, it has more potential to fill you out, but it might spill everywhere. Maybe some other guy's gonna knock your sandwich out of your hands. <laughs> Combo hand. breakers are the sandwich <laughs> spilling over. You're trying too hard and you're going too big. Blech. So you gotta be very careful about the length yeah. of your sandwich and the kind of things you put in there. The evolution of that, is, as everybody worked their way through, it was really cool because it just made it way more open and you could basically express yourself a lot better on how you did combos. And then as we were playing and talking about the game, we talked about a couple of things. One thing was the fact that in the old game, you could just keep spamming combo breaker because there was no lockout. Yeah, this so was the was problem with old KI. I put in there was a lockout timer, and that was really, really good. So then we started getting around this idea of like, is that enough? And counter breaker was something that we pitched during that as the solution to that. Again, a bit off the repost. And that's definitely an example of where, hey, there's already a lot we're trying to figure out, and that just got put on the back burner uh, because they need to build out the game first. Much later, I think we went to E3 and there was some great matches with Maximilian, and there was just something missing. JJ was there too. Combo was watching, we showed recording. Facility with the instinct mode. That's nice breaker there from Max. Oh, he catches a nice breaker from Ken. There's a drama to fighting games. 
I kind of throw that evil final with from Injustice up there where you're like, oh, please let this end, right? Like, it started to feel that way with the KI because there was just so many combo breakers. Just combo breaker, combo breaker, combo breaker. And that announcer is awesome when those are dramatic moments, not when that is the only moment that you're hearing. Yeah, it was a lot of like, we need to fix this. And it's kind of talking with the Double Helix team about like, hey, remember my original pitch? I had this whole repost thing. It was like, you could break a combo breaker somehow. And like, so there was a, a way to like go back and forth with it. I remember us just slamming our heads and just like, what the, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about this? And I wanna say it was Dave Hall. He was our lead combat designer. He loves poker. And he's like, Mike, what if we let players bluff? I was like, what do you mean? What if we let players fake like they're gonna do a thing and it really sets them up. So if the person actually breaks on it, they get locked out and then they get opened up to huge damage. And we're like, you're a genius. <laughs> this sounds great. <laughs> this is actually a fantastic idea. Dude, I, the, the, the day that they had me over, it was like late at night, right? Um, and they, they had shown me Thunder for the first time. And I just got to mess around with Thunder and it was like, he looks incredibly cool, like ridiculously cool. I got to see Thunder stage. And they're like, we want to show you something else. So they brought me over to this other, this other machine, um, this, other, this other workstation. And they're like, we got a new mechanic we want to throw in the game. Uh, and, I'll, I'll work, and they're like, we want, to do, we want to have you try it before we describe it. So Bao was here for this. It was a typical KI <laughs> late night. It was like 8 o'clock and everyone was still there at 8 o'clock, right? So they're trying to get my gut reaction on this just in a core gameplay mechanic. And they're like, try to combo break and break the heavies. So I already know what heavies are like and I could break them. Bam, break the heavies. And they're like, okay, well now we're gonna try to break your heavies. So they break my heavy. I'm like, okay. They're like, this time, press the medium punch and medium kick button while you're doing a combo. I'm like, what, what? Like, what, at any point in the combo, they're like, when you do the heavy specifically, like, you already know how to break heavies, right? We know how to break heavies. So now press the medium kick and me medium medium punch button. So I did it and the character like stopped and did something. I'm like, wait a minute, I can I can stop my combo? What's that good for? They're like, break it again. Character went up, did the pose, and then caught the move and counter breaker! It was Mike's voice in the in the background, G -g 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 counter breaker! And then they just continued to wail on me for the next like five seconds. And I looked at the damage and the damage was like 50 to 60%. I was like, holy shit. Wait a minute, if you know that somebody's going to break, if you're that much in somebody's head, you get like insane damage, they're like, you got it. I was, I, like, I, I can I even put myself in that moment. I was like, oh my God, this game is cra- This game is crazy. This game is going to be insane. Like, you're just, you're just building, like, th this is, this is hype incarnate. Like, you're just creating this game to make things insanely hype. I don't, I, I, what, what? Let's continue. And I believe we were able to prototype it very quickly. And as soon as we did, I think I was one of the first fucking people that <laughs> they prototyped it against that wasn't like Microsoft or DH. Thank you for that, by the way. Anybody that made this game and might be watching, thank you and for that. we all that. played, like we all got, you know, the big, just ear to ear grins are like, oh, this is good. This is really good. Went down to Double Helix, like not much after that, right before Evo. We show up and they're like, we have something really cool to show you guys. And it was Counter Breaker. And just the sound of it. And I believe it was Mike's voice. And it's just like, <laughs> In KI, it's really interesting because there's a constant interaction between two people. So it's like, I get a combo, so I have to think, what is my combo going to be? I have to worry about like how hard I'm making it to break, what breakpoints I'm giving you, should I reset, should I spend meter, did I react to your lockout? There's all these things I have to think about. For the defensive player, it's every single part of the combo is like, you're recognizing it in your mind, and as it reaches your mind what it is, it needs to be sent to your hands, do I break this part of the combo or not? So it's like constant, like data is going from like game. It's like, all right, that's a heavy linker. Hits your brain. Do I break the heavy linker? Does it need to go down to my hands to break it? No. Next part of the combo, like this. Do I need to, no. Next part, man, he still has, I'll hit the Damn it. No matter what's going on Damn in match, it. no matter what has happened to you, no matter what mistakes you just made, you can always make a worse one or a better one within a, just a couple seconds. That's why I think KI is an extremely emotional game. You can't make a decision and then stew on it for a bit. You're like, oh man, I made a mistake. I'm gonna die here. 
okay, there's that combo, okay, here's the little reset. It's none of that. It's you got hit and you have to like viscerally make another decision for like another 30% of your life immediately. And if you don't make that decision, you have to make another one. It stacks your mistakes on top of each other very quickly. And in the end, when you win or lose, when you win, you feel like relieved. That was exciting. And I'm so glad I made like all these correct decisions that it feels great. And when you lose, you're like, oh, I like, this is the worst. Like, I can't believe. You know, you're excited to get back into it. Hells Rift was an instinct, the extra damage and the throw. TJ's coming back. <laughs> that face. Life is so hard, dude. <laughs> I'm so fucked. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm so fucked. <laughs> I've always thought that audio and, and music is one of those things that is one of the most impactful things you can do in a movie, in a television show, in a video game, but yet so many people don't index on it enough to make it a part of the experience it should be. Double Helix, just they embrace it. Yes, for anyone that's curious, exclamation point KI if you want to watch this on YouTube or support the creator on uh, Patreon. Exclamation point KI to get that information. And they saw what was so important about it in the original game. And their audio people and our audio people just really just put their heads together and made something incredible. And I think that because the bombastic announcer was and the music was so important to the original game, again, it was one of those like, well, we can't go back on this. You know, we've got to make this as good as it's been in the previous games. The original KI had a very specific look and feel that was so different, like you mentioned, to all the other fighters out there. There was, you know, slightly more gothic or just a, like more grungy, you know, look and feel to things. And like it was such a diverse cast and we wanted to stay true to that as well. So we got to work with Mick Gordon. He just, he got it. He saw and heard the previous stuff and he's like, all right, all right. And he saw what we were trying to do to updating the, the characters and adding, um, just layering, like the way we're approaching some of our lore stuff and everything like that. And he took that stuff and he just ran with it. And the fact that Mick was able to take the 90s sound of the guitar riff on the title screen, or even the way Jago's music was both sort of grounded in the original Jago music, but not 90s anymore. It had this nice kind of cross across genres and across decades. In uh, Jago's stage, when you hear the, uh, they call it throat singing. <laughs> Mick actually came to the, uh, the studio and he actually recorded the team actually doing like the background vocals for that stuff. So it was like, it was just one of those cool moments. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Like we're all just tripping out and stuff like that. Uh, short story chat. Um, at my, there was a high school dance in the, uh, not a high school. I think it was a sixth or seventh grade dance in, in my school. Very, very tiny class, right? this story but uh yo Aris, thanks for the host man um you could submit music uh for the dance so i had my only cd that i ever owned of course was killer instinct and uh at the dance they were like we're accepting music so i submitted jago's theme to ki and what was all the other music at the dance it was gangster's paradise uh, the Tootsie Roll songs like that. And uh, nobody knew what Killer Instinct was. Very few people knew even what KI was. But Jago's theme is like a, a really good, like general dance theme. And they chose it. And uh, everyone was dancing to Jago's theme. I'm like, this is, this is crazy. This is, this is insane. Later on in that same uh, high school gymnasium, my mom would put on, my mom and my dad ran a theater guild and they would put on plays and they did a theater, uh, a show called The Wizard's Crystal, which I was a stagehand for. And for the big entrance of uh, the evil wizard with his like, his like hunchback of Notre Dame sort of like, you know, character that is with him, they would crawl through the audience as they made their way to the stage to perform. And they did that to 
Saber Wolf's theme. <laughs> dun, 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 And they did it like nobody knew it was Killer Instinct music. There was no copyright issues because things weren't being recorded. It was for a small little town in the middle of nowhere in California that I grew up in. And uh, yeah, there was Killer Instinct music all over the place. That's my, that's my story. Rare liked making audio that was related to what was going on in the game. They had done that with the original Killer Instinct, they'd done it with Banjo, they'd done it with Donkey Kong, but it was Double Helix that was like, well, we could take that idea and just extend it. When you play KI, if you turn off all the sound effects, all the announcers, which you can do in the game, you're gonna see how the music changes on a note-by-note -note basis with combos, with combo breaking, with every gameplay mechanic the game actually sets up. There's a musical beat. The music will actually turn back when a combo breaker happens. And then as soon as the payout happens, when you cash out the damage of a combo, it kicks in. Leading up to this idea of we're gonna audio script the sound effects of an ultra combo to sound like that character's riff is just brilliant. When we were talking about music to Jed, who was our sound engineer. Jed was such a cool dude. He is, he's the guy that, uh, we, we were all talking with him, we were like, is that like a TIE fighter? When, <laughs> is that like a TIE fighter sound effect? When Spinal hits you with his skulls? And he's like, maybe. <laughs> there was like, he's like, it's, it sounds similar, huh? He had this accent, super cool dude. Um, him, him and Mick just, they, they, they redid the sound mixes when I did the trailers. So they gave everything like way more impact and way more like, they do this when you have a trailer. They don't keep the in-game audio for everything. They, you essentially submit a trailer with a bass core audio. I turn off all the sound effects of the music and like all the ambient sound that's in KI. And uh, I give them just a raw hit audio of what the physical hits and the character voices are are actually keep the character voices out because they add that stuff in. When the, when the trailer mix, the audio mix comes in from Jed and Mick, they essentially have this really cool, crisp ass sounding track for the trailers. Um, and yeah, these are these guys who did this. We wanted to make sure that the music was also escalating in conjunction with what's going on in the match. There was like actually different stages to the music depending on how far into the match you were and to the point where when you perform one of those ultras, it actually would play out, you know, the songs themselves and stuff. This was a labor of love for a lot of us. Like we were fully, fully invested and we worked tons and tons of hours on this stuff, but it was because we believed in it. So there was stuff in there that we spent extra time in like, you know, worked weekends just to see if we can get stuff in there. Like for example, the, the musical ultras were something that we just randomly talked about at one point. It started from Oh, what was this dude's name, John? I always forget his name and he was always so helpful. Uh, what was his name? He built me the tool to make trailers. Like when I, when I was first making trailers in KI, they, the camera was so wonky. Like all, all Chris, yeah, Chris, dude. He was such a nice guy. Like he he got he got wind that I was making the trailers, and I was like trying my ass off to try to get these angles and shots and pan shots and depth of field and focus and all this stuff. I'm trying to do this on like an Xbox 360 controller, right? There were moments where I called in Jessica. I'm like JJ, I need you to hit the L button because all my other hands are over here pressing these buttons, and I need to get a tracking shot of Fulgore or a tracking shot of this stuff. And then Chris at one point he's like. When I come in to, to grab capture for um, either Sadira or Orchid or something, he's like, I made something for you. And in just his spare time, he, nobody asked him to do this. He just got hold of I did it. He created an interface on the controller for an Xbox 360 controller that allowed me to pan, zoom, slow pan, use the analog stick in accordance to camera movement so that it didn't just go fast or really fast. They just did this stuff just to check on graphical issues, so they didn't have this. But... Yeah, exactly, Mike. Uh, Chris Sabaggio, that's his name. Uh, and he just made me a tool that allowed me to make these trailers actually like, I did it all on a fucking controller, but I had control, right? I was able to move the camera around, like actually panning and capturing shots. But did they need to do that? They didn't. Like that was, once again, another testament to 
KI and they just wanted this shit to be good. It's extra time and like, you know, worked weekends just to see if we can get stuff in there. Like for example, the, the musical ultras were something that we just randomly talked about at one point. It started from the escalating music in the, the, the stages themselves. And on top of that, like the ultra is kind of like the high point for one of the matches. So we were talking about like, we want that to be reflected in the music as well. And during that process, that's when, the, when Jed and I were talking, we're like, well, let's see if we could throw a little extra something on there to actually create a system that would actually drive the music whenever you performed one of the ultras. We were together for, for I don't know how long, but we were doing this stuff on our own time just seeing if we could figure out the system. And then we got it in and we're like, I don't even know if this is gonna work, you know, and stuff like that. And we actually played it like the first time and actually hit one of those ultras and it went to beat and everything. We were just like, like, okay, this is good stuff. It's be like dun dun, dun dun dun, dun dun, and then you get the juggle, dun 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 dun, like at the end and I was like, what was that? That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> We had very strict pillars of the game of like what was the most important and if things didn't fit within those pillars they got you know cut so like for us it was like rebooting what ki was bringing back those feelings those emotions that nostalgia but updating it it was having a tournament viable combat every input needed to be tight and responsive and then also it needed to play well online every modern game has to play well online if you can't do that you're dead on arrival well, we were like, okay, so we're gonna make the fighter, and we wanted to make the best KI we could, and the that season one footage style networking was the best that we could get. Early on, we had all of our animators and designers and everything set up all of their animations such that they know that this rollback can happen, so that we can make conscious decisions of what can happen when a rollback happens at a specific point. Uh, it was it was another day I was down there for for trailer stuff and I remember seeing either um, Tom or Tony. I'm not I, I think it was I think it was Tony. I always get it's tough to get a mix up because they are twins. Um, but the the dudes that were responsible for GGPO were suddenly at Double Helix's offices, and I was like, oh shit, really? Uh, and I didn't know the reason they were that wasn't going to pry or anything. But immediately in the back of my head, I'm like. Are they going to try to put rollback into KI? And I and that was the, always the thing that I was the most worried about with Killer Instinct was everything requires such precision and timing in in KI in terms of breaking auto doubles, in terms of setting up your counter breakers, all that kind of stuff. That if this game doesn't have frame precision, it's going to really fall apart in an online environment. And as soon as I saw that, oh, the the cannons in some way are involved. That's interesting. I actually got a lot of hope because I was I was worried leading up to the launch of KI that this game might not have great netcode. Um, and overall, just like man, this game could be amazing, but it might just have terrible netcode like everything else. Uh, let's continue. A lot of that is sort of a team effort that we got it all such that it handles everything correctly. Early on, we is when we decided we need to use this netcode. So that's part of the reason why the game launched how it did with the six fighters was because we were originally planning to have a full box title later on in the cycle, but they were like, no, we want you to be a launch title. Um, so uh, people are asking, did the game have good online back then? In 2013, it did. It actually had really good online. There were some interesting things put into place. Uh, for example, if, a, if somebody disconnected, the game would replace the opponent uh, without warning with an AI. So if something desynced, uh, which happens a lot with, with online fighting games, right? Because the technology at the time has clearly gotten better with desyncs and resyncs. Uh, if something desynced, it was, Killer Instinct was a little, a little sensitive to that. Um, oh, apparently the cannons gave advice on the netcode and made some tweaks with Brandon, right? And it's for things like that. It's like, how do you handle desyncs? How do you handle audio rollbacks? Uh, because the nice part is that KI didn't have any issues with audio rollbacks. Street Fighter Cross Tekken came out like the year before and it was a rollback 3D online fighting game and it was plagued with that shit. It was terrible. Like the audio and the visuals were just all over the place. It was clear that Capcom had no idea what they were doing. But when KI first launched, it was good. Like 
it it functioned right it, and it felt like oh it's responsive and it works online i'm not thinking about the online all the time like this rollback is actually working but there were issues and a lot of those issues got fixed with even in the first season and then when iron galaxy got a hold of it and they have even their crazier understanding and prowess of all the online games they did already with capcom it got even better and even better so you essentially had the people that respect and understand rollback the most making season one and then people that were actually the gods at that shit creating season two and beyond to create one of the best online fighting games of all time. They did it in like 10 months. Huh? And again, we didn't yeah. push them. Literally the idea was what's done, we'll ship. And some of that led to, again, it was nice because it, it fit this push to get online done as fast as possible. I wanted to play online with Jago. I wanted to play online with Double Helix. It was like, while we were in development, it's like, how soon can we get to the point where build review is on live? Because that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build a new character comes out, that character drops into an online fighting game community and people use them. So that enabled us to, we can ship with four. Which was, that's what we thought we were gonna do for a while. Four, four backgrounds, no story mode. Maybe we can get KI one arcade done. You know, the emulation that came with the $40 SKU. Maybe we can't. But they busted ass. They were having fun. At E3, I see that announce, right? I mean, that was incredible. I believe nostalgia is a very powerful tool in the game industry. Once something gets to be 10 and 15 years old, if it was beloved, you have this opportunity to ignite the passion of people that have been playing games for a long time. So while there were people, shall we say, in the industry or even inside Microsoft who thought, okay, this game will be good. It's great to have in the portfolio. We're gonna put it in the E3 trailer. It's just this weird short thing. That's probably gonna be this little blip. It was the loudest moment at that press conference. The music starts, you get this buzz, the logo pops and boom! Coming to your home in 2013, all in on Xbox One! Jago. Ah! <laughs> oh no. Seeing KI just pop up on that big gigantic screen, I just like lost my mind, dude. I was just like, oh my god, KI is back. Killer instinct. We listen, and Killer Instinct is back only on Xbox One. Slain mired and wanted to work with for a long time. I'm fucking crying. Killer Instinct would be announced at E3 2013 as an Xbox One exclusive. Something that, due to the murky details surrounding the console's DRM policies at the time, wasn't exactly received with much positivity in the FGC. And again, Killer Instinct coming out later this year, exclusively for the Xbox One. We have a great partnership with Microsoft and with Double. Yo, yo, yo! Shortly after the announcement, it was also reported that the game's release would be a departure from other titles in the genre, as it would adopt a free-to-play model not seen before in fighting games. You know, at the time, Ken and I and, uh, were very much like, hey, how do we sell a fighting game differently, right? Because if you look at, at genres of games, there's so many people that play, some people consume all the content of an individual game, right? But my past experience with real-time strategy games showed me that 30% of the market at the time, when I was doing the Command and Conquer games, 30% of the people played multiplayer. 70% of the people never touched multiplayer. And as we looked at fighting games, we're like, wow, you know, we put all of this effort and time behind story modes, but there was a massive investment, right, for story modes like that. And I think about all the time and resources that would have gone into something like that, right? And you look at our project, and we're like, okay, we've got a year. Probably not something that we can put all this effort into. We've got to make sure that the fighting game itself is amazing. You know, we wanted to make sure the networking code was amazing. We've got other priorities. So what can we do here and how can we make a fighting game that caters to the way that most fighting game people play, right? Like, not everyone plays every character in a fighting game. Actually, most people don't unless they're dabbling through the story mode or something like that. And then they go back to their, you know, their mains and their second, their pocket characters and stuff. How can we take advantage of that? And how can we do something that's really fair to the players. Like one of the things that Ken and I were adamant about, because we were in this era of kind of very predatory microtransaction processes, we're like, okay, screw all that. Like, how do we how do we do this that would be super fair? And that's kind of where the discussion came from of like, okay, what if we sold the characters individually? So let's imagine incredible. But you gotta think, uh, at this time, Microsoft was hated, right? There's Microsoft is still dealing with 
the shit that Don Matrix set up for them uh, during 2012, 2013, and the Xbox One. The Xbox 360 did so well that it it set up Microsoft to feel like they could do anything. And what they were doing with the with the next console generation really pissed people off. And Sony took advantage of that. So by this time frame, you got to think of these from Ken and the perspective of the guys that were making these decisions on the microtransactions and how Killer Instinct is going to be work is going to be working. How you can purchase season one? What the hell a free character is it free to play? What does that even mean? Um, you got to start understanding where they're coming from. They're like, this is the beginning of of a multi year history now. You know, with Phil Spencer trying to get people back on their side at Microsoft that they've been. They've been tr trying to catch up for so long now, doing everything they possibly can to make everything about the Xbox affordable or valuable or, you know, uh, it increase the uh, diversity of their library and all this stuff, right? They've been dealing with that shit for years. And now they're still dealing with it right now, even with Xbox Live Game Pass. This was technically the beginning of it, right? This was the beginning when people that were in charge of KI were like, okay, we're in a rough spot right now. And even the people that like Killer Instinct are going to have a hard time buying this system just for this game. What do we do to make it as easy as possible to play it? Like, obviously the game costs 40 bucks for six or eight characters, but that was with like way more stuff. All the costumes, all the extra, the original KI, like all that stuff. 20 bucks at its core and actually free to play. And it's weird that a lot of people still misconcept that Killer Instinct, you have to buy all the characters individually. It's weird to go on the Windows 10 store and actually look at KI's reviews and it gets negative reviews because people are like, if I buy all the characters in this game, it's going to cost me 90 to to $100. That's insane. That's so predatory. But they don't realize that you can buy the definitive edition for like $20. You can buy like all the content in the game for super cheap. All of it. Like, you don't have to buy the whole thing at all if you don't want to. And all it was is that you can just take one piece of KI if you just wanted one piece. Um, but the problem is, and the problem still remains to this day, I talked about it, Killer Instinct still has an issue where it has too many ways of being accessible. To, to the point of which that it's confusing. It's actually confusing how you can purchase KI in a multitude of different fashions if you don't want to get multiple characters. If you buy multiple characters, do you get the full version? Well, now there's the full version. Here's a bonus version with extra costumes. The The actual communication of Killer Instinct and how you can buy the game and the different ways it's technically readily available is still a thing that plagues the game to this day. And is still a thing that's actually kind of, kind of confusing even on the Microsoft Store end. So I don't blame people for thinking that because KI is genuinely the easiest, most affordable way to play a fighting game with this much content out there. Um, it makes, it makes the, the seasonal DLC additions that modern fighting games have between like Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat, anything like incredibly expensive by comparison. So yeah, uh, let's, let's move on. Incredible success. In that world, what I would prefer us not to do is do what fighting games have done in the past. Here's 13 characters. Next year, here's 14 characters. Oh, and it's Turbo. And again, nothing against Street Fighter. I love Street Fighter. I bought them all. But I also think that that led possibly to some of the demise of fighting games through the late 90s and early 2000s of, do I really want to buy the 11th Street Fighter as a normal consumer? Is it really that different? So what I was saying was maybe we could make a fighting game where if we do do a sequel, it's all new characters. And if we do something new, like the difference between KI1 and KI2, well, we just retrofit what the people already have and it's free. So if you own season one, when season two and three shipped, you could go online and fight against all those characters. You didn't own them. If you like them, you could say, well, I like, I like Conra. Can I just, can I just buy Conra? Yes, you can. You could have season one and Conra. In fact, you could forget buying season one. You just get Jago and then you buy Conra. And maybe you want to be in the fighting game community, but all you want to spend is five bucks. Maybe at some point you buy more. Maybe that's all you care about. If you literally just have Jago from season one, you own a piece that's good enough that you can play forever. If this is your main, welcome to the community. I wanted to be able to try and build a fighting community that didn't shrink each time a new version came out. It grew, you know. And that's an absolute good observation. Like usually when fighting games continue in many ways, the community shrinks, right? Too many changes happen. 
too many new characters, and it keeps getting more and more expensive. So that's that's still a thing that Killer Instinct started the seasonal model, right? It began seasons of characters. The, the, the games that were before this, what, what were the biggest games before this that actually had updates? The last one was technically Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and then Marvel 3 got updated to Ultimate Marvel 3. But outside of that, Injustice and, and Tech and Tag, they were just adding like characters on characters. They're just, here's a new character, you can buy them. Here's a new character, you can buy them. To eventually do like the seasonal model, this game was the first game to technically do it. Also, yeah, Street Fighter 4 at the time too, to USF 4. It's the same thing. Sometimes we like to joke that certain games are us running up a hill like towards cannons, right? Being leading that charge of like, we're going to try something completely radical here um, and we'll see if it works. And I think that was part of that process with KI was like, okay, we're going to use KI as this test bed to see if we can sell games like this and if this is something that people will actually appreciate and gravitate towards. And I think that by the end of it all, it was a success, right, in how we did it. But it was fascinating to see all of the road bumps along the way of people being massively confused by like, wait, so I can buy this, but then there's this addition, but if I just spend this much, then I get the whole thing. They were like, what is this? How dare you release this game that you're just gonna charge us a million dollars for everything? It was the opposite response we thought that we were gonna get. I remember being really disappointed when I first heard that KI was going to be 20 bucks, that it was going to be this small game that launched with as many characters as they possibly could put out. I just wanted to go to a store and pick Killer Instinct off of a shelf and have that experience. Just knowing that KI was going to be a much different kind of fighting game it made me kind of upset. It made me feel like they, they were approaching this like it wasn't a real game. However, as we know in the long run, this season model that Killer Instinct sort of adopted, that this is the beginning, this is season one, that's what it was started as, is eventually what fighting games would become now. And KI was technically the first fighting game to do that, where we're gonna put out so many characters, so many stages, by the end of this first season when Double Helix was working on it, we're gonna have eight characters, we're gonna have more stages, we're gonna add more stuff, we have an arcade mode that we're gonna add, and it just came and sort of trickled over time. The thing I didn't realize was that the barrier of entry for the game was pretty simple. The fact that if you wanted to just jump in and just get a single character, but it was free, is something that I think adopted more people to a fighting game than you can possibly think. For me, over time, they sort of developed what the fighting game model could be. What an easier way is to get people into fighting games because people love characters. People love just the fact that there's 50, 60, 75 Smash Brothers levels of characters in fighting games that will sell people on the game. But how many do they play? There's a chance it's probably less than the amount of fingers on one hand. There's a chance it might just be one. The fact that KI gave you that option and get access to the full game, I thought was huge. We love interfacing with our community. Our well, that was dumb. Fans and players in general. So we wanted to talk to them and say like, look, what we want is more players playing the game. And if I can get you a free copy that's gonna allow you to play the game and test things out and see if this is something that you like and wanna get into, I'm all for it. I wanna do that. We just wanted to expand the options beyond the norm. That's so we could get more people to play. All we ever wanted to do was have people play KI. I do remember seeing the announcement. Uh, I actually saw it through Max's video. Me personally, I didn't really care. I 100%, everyone knows that. Like, I saw it and I'm just like, cool, they brought it back. Not my thing. When I picked up my Xbox day one, I was supposed to hang out and play with my boys. We were like, oh, let's play Battlefield 4, blah, blah. I'm like, sure. Turned on the Xbox, they're like, hey, you can download KI for free. And I'm just like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I downloaded it. I never jumped on with my boys. I played for eight hours. Never it jumped on with the boys. Good. The poor boys. It was actually very surprisingly easy just to pick up, you know, because I wasn't like really good at the old KIs. I just played it, you know, casually because I had a lot of fun with them. But this game, it felt almost like natural picking it up. The combos are real elegant and beautiful. And as far as like how the cast looked, like Thunder couldn't look any better. Like he looks so cool. Just this big, big, badass dude, just like hitting you with tomahawks. So I think KI season one was actually a pretty fun game. I mean, I bought an Xbox One for it. They sold me on a console I had no intention of buying. <laughs> one of season one's main strengths was that it was a really good looking game. The characters were all really well animated. They really brought forward this like fluidity and these sort of aspects of these characters that before had only existed in the 90s, right? They, you know, you had to fill in a lot of the gaps with how these characters animated and looked. And they did, a, I thought, a, just a fantastic job with the art direction of this game. The netcode definitely enabled our community, for sure. Retro Zombie started this tournament called Bape at Beatdown. 
It was just a weekly tournament every Sunday. And at first, a lot of people didn't pay any mind to it. Every offline tournament, you would hear of a guy's name from that tournament or from the ranking system. And for me, that person was Gnarly Feats. I saw him up there. I was like, who is this? You know, who is this guy? He's the only Orchid on the leaderboard directly into CEO, the first CEO where KI was at. He made top eight. And it started being more apparent when if they were good online and they were, their win ratio was like 70%, they were definitely gonna do damage in person. I never felt like in KI in the beginning or any time when I played it, like, man, I can't find anybody who plays this character or I can't find people to play with because even from the very beginning, like, I was playing like with people across the US. So like, if I lose to somebody at my local, it's like, okay, I can play against them to learn the character they play, or I can play against somebody here or there or there or there or there, and it's like, I just had so many options. We did a lot of new things. So we not only bring KI back, we brought in this crazy, seasonal model that no one actually was using at the time. We had a free base game that Ken Lop will describe it as one of the most friendly demo ever. Because it basically, like, every week we rotate a different character, you get to play whatever character set you want, or you can just buy one character or buy the whole season, it is up to you. We want to be super consumer friendly, and we were trying and experimenting with all these new things. We hit all our target, we hit our financial target. I had a user target before we ship that I say, we'll hit three million players. And no one believed me. And people would say, yeah, of course he's a EP, of course he's just like set and go. We absolutely hit that number. Killer Instinct would be a success, paving the way for another season of content. However, in February 2014, it was announced that Double Helix would be purchased by Amazon, leaving the future of KI in question. I was so sad, dude. I remember having I remember having conversations with the guys at uh, at Double Helix when this happened, and uh, they were devastated. Uh, they were devastated that right at the end of the first season, they were essentially done. Um, but I, I think what they were what they were secretly hoping, from what I gathered, was that they were hoping that Microsoft was going to potentially buy them out because Microsoft was going out and picking up you know devs left and right, uh, not as much as they are now, but they definitely were in the market for that stuff back in, you know, 2013, 2014. But I think a big hope was that, man, my, Microsoft should just buy Double Helix, but they didn't end up doing that. And I, I, think, I think the reason is, here's what, here's what boils down a lot of Killer Instinct and why KI, many things were the way they were, why the time constraints were the way they were, why the game was made on, obviously, like, it's, it's not like a huge, giant AAA fighting game. It doesn't, it doesn't have the pedigree of other Microsoft titles, um, is because it's an Xbox Live Arcade game. It's, it's an XBLA title. It has XBLA title uh, effective budgets. It, it has XBLA title effective marketing. Um, so would Microsoft higher up than XBLA be interested in potentially acquiring a studio just for an XBLA title? Probably not, you know? Probably not. Because now XBLA is gone. <laughs> and that, that's, that's ultimately the thing that I have to say a lot to people. Like, why don't I think Killer Instinct is coming back? Why do I advocate, you know, to create awareness of KI, to let the people at Microsoft know that you have a huge fan base that is passionate and loves this. And for, for a game system that's trying to get fans back on their side right now, uh, Killer Instinct is one they should pay attention to because... It's always been an XBLA game. And since XBLA division is essentially gone now, it's it's hard to imagine Killer Instinct coming back until somebody pays attention. Like somebody out there focusing and paying attention that Killer Instinct comes back. I think it's I mean, I, I'm I'm saying theoretically here, and I'm not I wasn't I wasn't involved with any of this stuff, but I think it's one of the reasons why like Killer Instinct stopped development back in uh back in 2017 where that was like the last of KI, where they're not going to update it anymore. Season 3 stopped at season like 3.5. I think the reason for that is because XBLA was sort of phased out around that time frame. So it is what it is. You have to, Microsoft needs to be made aware. They were made aware that people wanted Banjo and Smash Brothers, and all of a sudden they did that. You know? Uh, weirder things have happened. And all things considered, it's a first-party first game. They own everything about Killer Instinct. It's owned by Microsoft. It's not coming out on anything else. It's just, we have to do something to, to put it in the heads, to put it on the timelines of the people that are responsible for making choices 
at Xbox right now, and that's essentially Phil Spencer and Matt Booty. And Phil's like the, the leading dude of Microsoft Games, and the head of Microsoft Game Studios is uh, is Matt. So that's why whenever I, I tweet things about Killer Instinct, I have to tweet at them. I, hope, I have to hope that at some point they're paying attention to their Twitters because these people are at the highest of the highest food chain when it comes to Microsoft. And it can be very difficult to to try to get some traction, even if we're number three trending in the world with Killer Instinct. So let's move on, because uh, this was a very tumultuous time for the development of the game. And you might notice we're just halfway through this documentary because the remaining story is even crazier when Iron Galaxy eventually got hold of the game. It was not an abrupt thing. It was kind of something that we'd actually seen different groups of executives kind of roaming the offices and stuff like that. But that's kind of standard for, for indie devs. You're just kind of, oh, you get potentially investors or, you know, someone from the management group or whatever it is and stuff like that. There's, you know, you just see people wandering the hall sometimes and stuff. So we didn't think anything of it until we started seeing the same group show up multiple times. And it was, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, day to day. It was over like a longer period of time up until the point that we suddenly started having some conversations and Amazon's name was thrown into the mix. It was a surprise to me. They just come in one day and they're like, surprise everyone, Amazon bought us. And we're like, what? <laughs> what does this mean? And they were just like, hey, it means that you guys aren't gonna work on Killer Instinct anymore. And we were very sort of heartbroken and, you know, we were like, it's our, it's our baby though. We, we wanna keep making it better. And, in bigger games, there's this thing called right of first refusal, which is basically the idea that if you are developing a game for me and your company is going to get bought, that you have to tell me, and I have the right to counter that offer and purchase you instead and all these things like that. I don't think we had any kind of verbiage like that at all in any of our XBLA contracts because these are these are games that we weren't used to. We're making digital games, right? And this game. Then that there you go, and there you go. That like I said, is the ultimate issue with Killer Instinct. It's, it was never technically treated as like a real Microsoft game. And that's, that's, the, that's the sad, despite 10 to 15 million downloads that it got, despite however many of those guys, like what Adam is saying here is the harsh truth. And he was the guy that was, these were the dudes that were running XBLA that got Killer Instinct made. They have to be honest. This is the way Microsoft works and in its divisions. This is the this is the tough thing. It's just an XBLA game. What do we do now? Like we don't even have the contractual verbiage to figure out a, a, a counter here. Amazon just bought them out. Game started under that umbrella, right? And so we never even thought about the idea of our developer getting bought out from under us for any of the games that we do. And um, it was like a truck hit me, right? Where I'm like. Our developer got bought? Are you kidding me? Like, and then it was like, why didn't we, did we have any, no, did we know? Like, and it was like, well, oh my God, I think the game's gonna, we're dead. Like, what can we do? That was rough. Like it was, um, Killer Instinct had been something that we had kind of devoted, you know, our entire beans to for, you know, for almost a year straight. And like, it was something that we were all invested in, we're all about, and we were fully just, on board, we're all about the game. We knew that what we were creating was just the first steps. Like the whole purpose of it was to create uh, an infrastructure, like a starting point that we can start adding stuff onto. You can modularity, just additional characters, different modes. Like, you know, this the story stuff was stuff that we'd always been planning on really pushing and such, but we had all these plans and all these different aspirations and such. But once we heard that, but we're like, but, but so, can we still do stuff with Microsoft and everything? But that was one of those, you know, no, it's, it's, it's a hard no, like we will be Amazon. And so that's it. We had to finish up the support for um, what was left of season one and then move on. Like it For anyone that's curious, no, a lot of people are saying that they, they essentially disappeared into Amazon and didn't do anything. Um, Several FGC people and uh, and myself and Kenny Stephen Simmons did go down several times to their Amazon offices to play uh, their follow-up title. And uh, they worked on it for a long time and it went through several different versions and variations. Um, and it was called Breakaway. It was a, um, 
a sort of team-based sport game where you had characters and a and essentially a ball and it was about scoring uh with the variety and skills of your characters and you know doing all this stuff it was it was all over the place right it was actually there was an integration with twitch because it was an amazon game and uh it was actually fun it was it was cool like there you might actually remember quite a bit of breakaway i still have like coins and t-shirts and everything for that but it was a much different it wasn't a fighting game right that just wasn't what amazon wasn't interested in making fighting games obviously they wanted like an esport game and that was their their big attempt in it it was legit good um the problem was is that I, i don't know what actually happened to all the individual devs um when they eventually got bought out by Amazon, or even if Amazon Games is still even making games, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that Double Helix at the time was essentially a fighting game dream team. It was composed of fighting game and combat, like the, the, the best fighting game and combat designers that were in the US at the time. And the only other company that had that, that had that sort of like talent at the time was NetherRealm Studios. And they were making Injustice and Mortal Kombat X. So the all the remaining like uh, American, there's, there's not a lot of um, uh, uh, like in the U.S. combat designers that are really good at combat designing that aren't already doing, you know, God of War or Sony stuff or right. These guys are all put together at Double Helix to make this game happen. And the problem is the the Amazon thing, while they still had all their uh, their design prowess to help them make those games. I don't know what eventually it led to, but I do know that Breakaway eventually got canceled, um, which is super unfortunate. It was, it was rough. Like it was, it was not a, it, it wasn't all like, you know, roses and puppy dogs and stuff. So it was, that was a tough time. I loved them. I mean, it was, I was sad. It's like we were already approved. We were going to do season two and suddenly they disappear. There was, succinct sadness for many of these people, you know, and there were lots of jokey conversations inside. Hey, we should just go get a building across the street and put up a Killer Instinct studio sign and see if people want to come. But we literally didn't want to form a new studio out of some (laughs) partial. Fighting games are an endeavor, right? And you need people that know them and you need studios that really can understand them. And Matt Booty was the best because he was like, you know, we talked to him about the whole thing. We presented like, this is what happened, blah. And he's like, well, Guess you should find another developer for it. And the subtext there was, keep making the game. And that was such a great feeling to be able to have an executive at Microsoft be like, believe in it, go make more, figure it out. We really believe in the title. We all feel that like, hey, we have something special here. So we did a lot of work to secure that we have funding for season two. Now that we have that part locked down, we just need to lock the developer down. IG was already one of the group that did a really good pitch for the original season one. What company that actually know how to literally drop into another person code base and help them to like do an amazing job to finish their titles? That's one thing that IG is really good at. Number two, this company that have worked with fighting games before, that is one of the things that I really look forward to. I want to make sure the group understand and have done either fighting games or at least third person game before because in fighting game, the animation and the gameplay are so linked together. It is super important for having a team that really understand that system and the thinking process behind it. And if you work with other teams, like not everybody really gets some of those things. And IG clearly gets it. All those add together, literally on that same day, I basically said, like, okay, we need to call IG. We had the discussion. Not many people at Iron Galaxy even knew that was happening. I was brought into that because uh, they wanted me to be lead combat designer. So I was, like, really studying the game at that point. Instead of playing it, you know, casual, competitive, like I play everything, I was, like, really digging in in a way I hadn't since, like, Tatsunoko versus Capcom. We knew that, well, you're not building this from scratch, and there's this relatively bespoke, not perfect piece of middleware that Killer Instinct is built upon. We want that. It ha- it's perfect. But you're going to have to learn how to use it. So it was going to take some time. I went to uh, uh, Iron Galaxy when they needed a trailer for E3 uh, to announce Season 2. This was 
pretty much double helix got bought out by Amazon at the beginning of 2013. Like it was like February or something like that. February to March. So by the time E3 happens, which is May slash June, Iron Galaxy had already uh, been hired and approved within a couple months in, in 2014. Sorry, 2014. And already working with the engine to get TJ Combo uh, conceptualized and executed. So much to the point where they actually wanted a trailer for a character that was super early. And when I say super early, animations were not finished. Um, several, several, several aspects of that character were not done. And that was one of the hardest trailers I had to make because they, TJ was so hot. Like he was so not ready to go, but they had to, right? They, they had these deadlines, they had E3. So Iron Galaxy with an engine that they had never used before started prototyping and making this character. This character was right out of the oven. And by the time they got to like Evo slash E3, he was playable. He was actually working in engine playable, looked like Patrick Ewing at the start, but completely playable. We were already using James, but that's where he became significantly more involved to help go and you know, teach is the wrong word. And Iron Galaxy is very smart, but sort of just show them tools of the trade. Even better, this goes to the infinite respect for Double Helix. They took a month to overlap train Iron Galaxy and everything they'd need to know to build the game. There was a period of time where Iron Galaxy was in our studio and we were giving them like overviews of how everything works and you know trying to give get them up to speed on using our engine before we sort of handed it off to them so they they were given opportunities to ask us questions you know like how does this work how do we do this how do you do that we tried to you know set it up best for them because we cared about the game our company benefits from the fact that we've done a lot of ports uh, we have a lot of really smart engineers that had to take existing code and turn it into something else on a new console what they did Skyrim Switch? Really, IG? Any of the IG guys in here? Y'all did Skyrim Switch? I didn't even know that. What the hell? <laughs> uh, wow. Whatever that may be, or a PC version. So not only did we get a heads up from Odell Red. Helix on- Isaac was such a cool dude. Um, I, every night that I worked like late into he was working QA at the time, and uh, every every late night that he was he was at the office, he would pretty much stay, and I would give him I like rented a car, I would give him like a ride back to his place, and we would just talk about like KI and shit. Um, yeah, like there was a lot of super late nights of me trying to get stuff working for the trailers, and just I, we don't have enough time. I'm just trying to get it done, uh, and he was always there chilling and. Keats was in the other room working on combat stuff, and James was always in the other room doing stuff. There was a lot of, a lot of really cool moments around that time. What their engine is all about. We also have people that are, are really good at deconstructing that stuff. And if there, let's say there wasn't any documentation on how to do stuff, we'd figure it out. But Double Helix was instrumental at getting us going. You know, without them, I don't think we would have been able to do what we did. They, they liked the game enough that they were willing to go to go do that effort. And again, infinite respect to Dave and Mike and the, the team there for for stepping up in that way. They could have just said, hey, we're sorry. You know, it's, the sequel's not ours, we're gone, we're gonna have to go do this other stuff. But they took the extra step to, along with Goddard, to help train Iron Galaxy to get them up to speed quickly. It gave us a chance, an impossible chance. Double Helix would take a month, including a one week on-site boot camp to help Iron Galaxy get up to speed with the tools needed to continue development on Killer Instinct. And soon it was off to the races, as once again, time was of the essence. We came back home and a version of TJ Combo to show at E3 was due in four weeks. Wow, <laughs> what a deadline. So that was a really tough month. You wanna talk about hitting the ground running, learning a whole new animation system, a whole new scripting system. It was crazy, it was a whirlwind. It was iterative and iterative and this and that. And you know, every time we'd, like fix something, then they'd learn something else to make the process better, but then we had to say, well, do we have enough time to actually do that now, or do we save it for later because we don't want to jeopardize the entire, you know, release and tease for the second season? It was, yeah, it was kind of hectic. <laughs> Fortunately, Microsoft... It was, it was insane. It was, 
things were coming in so hot and crazy. I remember there being a conversation at one point um, where, like, someone made the observation, and I was doing it during a trailer as I was trying to highlight moves. I'm like, TJ Combo doesn't have his knee. Like, his knee attack. Everyone's like, what? Like, yeah, his knee attack is in here. Like, he's got a jumping, his jumping light kick looks like a knee attack, but he doesn't actually have his, like, back forward, back forward, like, kick move. It's just not here. They, like, in the same day, I swear, had it ready for the trailer. Like, concepted it, put it in, got it going. Like, where, where TJ does, like, he essentially has tiger knee. He's always had it. Why does TJ Combo have a tiger knee? I don't know. But he's always had it in Killer Instinct 1 and 2. So, they did it. They, they just, well, we have to do it. Like, they're like, yeah, TJ Combo has to have his knee attack. We have to do it. Soft had already written their own character design document for TJ Combo. So they kind of knew what they wanted him to do and, they, and what they wanted him to look like. But I think pretty much 95% of that design document made it straight through to the real TJ Combo. And then we just got to work. And James Goddard from Microsoft came over to help out as well. And he scripted up the entire auto barrage system for TJ, which took a little more burden off of us. So they were really helpful in, in getting us that deadline. Even though it was an aggressive deadline, they were really helpful in getting us there. The goal with both Double Helix, but more so with Iron Galaxy. This trailer was so difficult to make, dude. Uh, it was a very challenging yeah, it was it was a very challenging trailer to make because we were was trying to hide the stuff that wasn't ready for TJ yet that was going to eventually look better. See, was partially because of how fast they had to go, and partially because we had built up to the point working with Double Helix a, a very specific process to how each character was built, and we wanted them to learn that. So TJ Combo was built by Goddard, and he built it in a way that could be repeated. The object was how fast can we turn over the reins. You know, it should be Iron Galaxy that's designing these characters from scratch. We'll do the guiding, but the goal was not let's build combo and then suddenly they're a little bit work for hire-ish. The goal was we need our developers to love what they're building the same way Double Helix did. I, I know the passion of Iron Galaxy is real, but it will get super real when they're making their character and they're adding their modes to the game. It's so true. Game. Four weeks later, we had some playable version of a near-complete TJ Combo who had early blocking animations. They weren't polished, so things were looking a little stiff. Not the quality you would usually show players. You can tell that, like, they got the project, and Microsoft's like, congratulations, you guys are now working on KI. And they're like, great. And they're like, how long until we can need a character? Tomorrow. And they're like, oh, God. So they just, like, had to scrap together a bunch of stuff. And that is an additional challenge because that message doesn't come through to anyone who's not paying really close attention. So a lot of the community just sees TJ Combo in the game, they're like, his mouth doesn't even move. You guys are amateurs. And it's like, well, we had four weeks. Believe me, his mouth will move in four more weeks. Uh, so like our first impression with people was, oh, Iron Galaxy stinks. This TJ Combo is not up to the quality of the other characters. It's like, absolutely he wasn't up to the quality of the other characters. He had four weeks of development time, right? So the challenges were not just on the dev end, it was also on the community end with getting people to understand that, unfortunately, this is the first impression we had to make and that things would improve. They were largely known for ports. They were known for just taking already existing stuff and just taking it and putting it on another piece of hardware or up it. So I was very, very cautious about this entire situation. I wouldn't say I was optimistic because I honestly really wasn't. But once we started seeing how fast Iron Galaxy was taking stuff and making it as good as they possibly could, they hired me after doing the trailers of this first season of KI to immediately start doing the trailers of the second season. I was in-house with them as they were literally figuring this stuff out, as they were working their butt off to get TJ Combo ready for E3 with like, I'd say only a, maybe a month of time. The fact that they were able to get stuff done so fast, the fact that, the fact that they were able to condition themselves to making a fighting game and adding systems and manipulating what the previous engine had done, they killed it, man. So the characters in season two, I think, is where a lot of players got to see where this game was going. Killer Instinct was gonna take a step forward. That's a big difference from season one because a lot of what Double Helix was doing was trying to recapture the imagination of the original games. Gameplay-wise, 
I feel season two and the future of KI from after the first season when Iron Galaxy took it over resembles a game like Darkstalkers. Characters have a lot of really unique things they can do. The, the combo systems kind of dramatically change character to character where in season one, characters had a unique combo trait. Now the traits are just wacky. Creatively, they just go absolutely nuts. And I, I appreciate that because it allowed Killer Instinct to, to really grow as a fighting game. This goes to the freedom that I was talking about. We want a season two, it needs to be Killer Instinct. This is what Killer Instinct means. But at the same time, you can't make 80 characters, you know, that all fit this sort of mold that was an evolution of original Killer Instinct of one and two. So have at it. What would you do? When they had that trailer that showed like seven different silhouettes and they're wildly different. Everyone's like, this is the broccoli man. What is it? <laughs> I never thought of that when making this, when I made this artwork. <laughs> I never, when, when, I, when I made this artwork for this trailer, nobody at Microsoft or myself, until the trailer came out, everyone's like, who's Broccoli Man? <laughs> I was like, oh shit. <laughs> oh no. This For something like Killer Instinct that has aliens and fire beings and you know, werewolves, like where can you possibly go? Like maybe I, you know this or that and they went above and beyond with that imagination. How well they did with it is honestly astounding to me. Like, it's crazy how the first two characters were so cool, their designs were so interesting, TJ and Maya. And then after that, all the characters that came out, they started looking better, they started animating better, they started having these crazy game plans. The Ripter came out after that, and we're like, what the heck is this character? Is a dinosaur? I was like, all right, well, this game has gone crazy. It's like a run character, doesn't have a normal backdash, has like all this stance moves and stuff. And so like, it was one of those things where, even though in the beginning, I think everybody's a little nervous. To me, when I saw the character designs and everything, I was like, perfect. They realized that this is a game with like a ninja guy fighting like a robot guy, fighting a dinosaur, fighting, fighting a guy who's literally fire, fighting a giant golem. Like this game is absurd. For me personally, it really, really, really stood out when Hisako came out. This is one of the sickest female fighting game characters I've ever seen. This girl was immediately like, she is awesome. It is this undead ghost girl that was killed in, a, in an ambush and she is a ghost guardian that protects her village and just she teleports around the screen and she crawls along the ground like Sadako from the ring and just she has jump scares in her intro. She can absorb into your body and like crush your joints up. Like it was such a fresh character design. I wouldn't say there was ever a need from anyone to be experimental. It was a natural progression of the idea that all of these characters needed to be very unique. Uh, and we did our design in, you know, maybe a backwards way sometimes, uh, but it ended up being really organic where we would get art of Conra and then have to look at that art and decide what his gameplay would be. Are we inspired by any piece <laughs> wow. of this guy's visual design in, in a way that makes us think, let's make a sand wizard. You know, maybe he leaves sand traps around and, you know, scorpion spikes come out of them and we can play on all these mummy tropes. And, you know, that led to some really unique stuff. You've seen some things kind of like that on some other characters who leave like blood puddles and have spikes come out of those or Eddie and Guilty Gear and stuff like that. So it's not totally unique. We're not aiming to be totally unique from everything in the fighting game space. We're aiming to be totally unique from everything that's currently in KI. And then something like Agonos happens where we're talking about uh, the early versions of Agonos on paper were just, we want a big juggernautish character. That's all we had on paper was this slot is gonna be for just something massive. It was a feeling I loved having in the X-Men games of just having this character that filled the screen like Sentinel or Juggernaut. And most big characters like that up to that time were always grapplers. Juggernaut was not a grappler. He was a screen filling character who was all about armor and going and just ignoring your attacks and being a, a big old bully. And I wanted to bring that to Killer Instinct. And we all agreed that that was gonna be cool. We just didn't know what we were gonna do. Maybe it was gonna be a big Frankenstein, you know, who knows? And then the ideas kind of get massaged a little bit. We're all talking about maybe some sort of uh, rock or stone golem. And uh, then the art comes back with this cool looking rock monster. And we're talking about what if he like ripped his own arm off and hit you with it or pulled chunks out of his body and threw them at you. And then we started talking about 
what if that actually changed his weight and he was faster or slower? And uh, engineering team was like, stop, you're crazy. And then <laughs> stop, uh, one of the please, animators stop. was like, what if he built a wall with a piece of his body and you couldn't go through it? I was like, you're a genius. And then I take it at the engineering team. They're like, please don't do that. It will be the buggiest thing of all time. <laughs> and we pitched it to Microsoft and they loved it. So we told the engineering team, you're doing it, good luck. <laughs> and it was really buggy for a really long time and really hard, but uh, you know, we found some magic in there because it's not just saying, let's do something fighting games don't do often, where we manipulate the screen boundaries. It came about in a very organic way where we were trying to find this character's identity just for his art and for himself. You want cohesion, right? You want gameplay that matches sound, that matches art, that matches control. It just comes together to make something beautiful. And when that happens, you get something like Agonos, which is super memorable, super interesting to watch. Feels like it breaks the rules of fighting games in a way that no one ever has. Not because we set out to do that, but because that was the right thing to do for that character. Without saying it in a negative way, I don't know if Double Helix would have come up with that stuff. So in a way, there was this off benefit of the fact that they get bought away and we bring in a, a new set of eyes into the Killer Instinct world and they come up with this crazy awesome and the game gets new legs beyond just, hey, there's more characters that are kind of like season one. <laughs> Iron Galaxy and Microsoft's work on seasons two and three of Killer Instinct would bring more than just new characters to the series. Improved netcode, lighting, new music from Atlas Plug and Cell Dweller, and single player content like Shadow Lords would also be incorporated into the free to play title. Iron Galaxy also brought a change in balanced philosophy to the game, taking a much more active approach to the method than most other fighting game developers at the time. Double Helix was very arcade philosophy. They're like, this is the game until next season, this is what you've got. And my philosophy is not like that at all. I think that, you know, I, I'm much more thinking about how things can be or in the future rather than how they were in the past. A lot of my influence at the table was saying, no, let's actually update this game constantly and let's not be apologetic about it. Let's tell the fans, listen, every time we add a new character to this game, we're upsetting the balance just by the nature of adding a new character. And things are gonna have to change every single patch that we add a character, because now we have to see how this character stacks against all the existing characters. And this problem is exponential. You know, this is a much more complicated problem on character 30 than it was on character nine. And you have to get the players on board with that idea that this is gonna be a constantly shifting ecosystem. It's really hard to find a fighting game that launches first and is good. Like that is like stands the test of time good. It's always fun in, when you're exploring the system, but inevitably pretty much every game they have really every vanilla version's broken characters and game breaking bugs usually. And I think KI season one ended up being no exception to that. Looking back on it, the game was just incredibly broken. Like there was like so much, for lack of a better term, BS in the game that it was like if you weren't playing Saber Roll for Sidera, it was kind of hard to win because Saber Wolf having a zero frame shadow move that he can curve stash and cross you up with it immediately. And if you weren't preemptively blocking, you were getting hit. And then Sadira having the best unbreakable combo in the game. So it was really hard to deal with. One of the main disadvantages of season one was that uh, the breaker game actually ended up not mattering that much. Combos in KI are like the big thing about it, right? When you get a hit, you get this combo and there's an interaction between both players. And in season one, the way you would do combos most of the time is you would start the combo, do anything, the smallest, teeniest bit of a combo, and then do like a shadow ender to end the combo, and you did like 35% every time. So like, why would you even extend the combo at all if you could just take this free, like big chunk of damage? So if you go back and watch the KI top eight, the very first year it was at EVO 2014, like all the combos are like, just like one hit, one chance, and the combo, 35% knockdown, like what happened? Fighting games are really hard to make. <laughs> and you may release something that you think, like, this is the way that I think it's going to be played. And then people get their hands on it, and they play never it in happens. ways that you never imagined. So one of yeah. the things that we really wanted to do was make sure that Killer Instinct stayed true to the two-way interaction. So we had to make sure that if you're doing something to somebody, that person should be able to do something in return, and you should also be able to react to that as well. And that game of constantly playing chess at full speed at all times, that two-way interaction was the thing that we wanted to touch on the most. In KI, you can't really hide from your gut reaction. When you have a reaction to something, like it's very common in KI when you talk to players, and they're like, I don't know why I broke there. I knew it was a bad idea, and my, I just couldn't stop my hands. Like, my hand, like I just couldn't stop them. I find that a fascinating side of fighting game design, where players 
have this instinctive thing that they do. Like, I'm a very reserved player, for example, and other players are like, you know, balls to the wall, like super aggressive, and it shows in the breaker game. It shows that they guess early. It shows that they can't be conditioned to stop breaking. Other players will never break or like very rarely break. Very smart with the overfield he's able to counter breaker three times. Will make the stop or does he just not believe? This sort of reservedness and aggression, this doesn't come out in a lot of other fighting games. KI brings it out of you in spades. You have no choice but to, to bury yourself, you know, in front of your opponent and engage in all the nasty sides of your fighting game habits that you don't want to explore to them. You don't want to show them that, you know, yeah, if you do this to me, I'm just going to die every time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, I can't stop it, I'm not that good. I think a lot of fighting game players in Season 2 who are used to games that didn't do that, you know, oh, I could hide from my bad habits here. I don't have to play the side of the game if I don't want to. In KI Season 2, they tried to make you play that game. And for me, there's just so much more richness there that I, I really liked it. And other players who wanted to avoid that, because they wanted, they liked their stability, guaranteed damage with broken characters. They didn't like it as much. <laughs> as far as KI community goes, it was it was maybe a failed experiment. There's always been this wall between the players and the developers. It's partially a language barrier thing because you know a lot of the players here are dealing with. Oh my God! What? Um. <laughs> oh God! I forgot about that chat. Let's just really quick. One eighteen. It was maybe a failed experiment. There's always. I want you to see what just happens here. I want you to just absorb Wisdom what happens wall here. Between the players and the developers. It, Jago it, it's combo breaks. Okay? Jago gets a combo breaker. Partially a language barrier. Instinct cancels that shit. Barrier thing because, you know, a lot of the players here are dealing with Gets 30% health back. I forgot about that shit. Breaker instinct was just... Oh my god, it was some bullshit, like dude. With Japanese devs, and it's just impossible to communicate. And of course, back in the day, we didn't have social media. We didn't have developers that had a social media presence, so you couldn't go knock directly on their door. You always had to go through a community manager if you wanted your feedback heard. So the experiment that I really wanted to try when they made me lead combat designer was to go out on Twitter, you know, with my meager following and say, yes, I'm the lead combat designer, let's have a dialogue and be part of the community and show up to tournaments and play against top players, you know, in casual stations. You know, instead of having the live streams for character reveals and balance reveals be showed off by community managers, what if the combat design team was on the couch doing it? And we could really explain ourselves and really talk to people about not only what we did, but why we did it. I call it a failed experiment because what I think it ended up doing was also poisoning the well in a kind of way. It kind of spoiled people. There were definitely a group of players who considered themselves top players who became more interested in influencing the development of the game than they became interested in solving the game and being great at it. And that resulted in a lot of ultra negativity, a lot of, you know, kind of rallying their fans to kind of become a bandwagon of, of kind of hatred and negativity towards the developers, towards our balance choices. So it was a pretty crazy adventure. I think I learned a lot about it, about how to approach balancing games. Uh, I think my views on how to do it basically 180'd from the beginning of KI to the end. And I also learned a lot about how to decipher kind of the code of group speak. I'm gonna give you a great example of this. A lot of people are, are really mad at a certain thing, and they're rallying together to be mad together because they want change, right? Jago is too strong. His healing is through the roof. I did all that damage, and now he's got it back. I'm pissed, Iron Galaxy, what gives, right? And I think, you know, maybe a less experienced developer would be like, I guess the healing's too much. They're all saying it's too much, let's reduce the healing. We did not do that. We instead took four months to really study Jago and figure out the root of the problem. We wanted to find the disease, not the symptom. Because we always had this feeling that the healing was a symptom. And when we really dug into it, we were like, okay, Jago doesn't have any bad matchups in the entire game. They're his worst matchups of 5-5. Five five. Why is that? Jago's not weak anywhere on the screen, actually. He's only kind of weak mid-screen. He's really good full screen and he's really good up close. But as soon as he's mid-screen, he has this magical move called the wind kick where he's immediately in your face and he's only like negative two. So he can immediately get out of his worst distance in any matchup and be at, at his best distance. So we nerfed wind kick frame advantage. We didn't nerf the healing. We said, okay, medium and heavy wind kicks are more minus now. The heavy one's punishable, the medium one is uh, sometimes punishable. And we told people why we did it in the patch notes and they hated it. 
They all erupted. This is not what we asked for. We wanted you to nerf the healing. The healing is what was pissing us off. Why did you do this? Jago players are gonna have to rethink their game plan now, so they're pissed too. Everyone's big mad. And then a month and a half later, no one was complaining about Jago anymore. And new matchup charts were coming out, and Jago now had four or five bad matchups in the cast. Because we found the disease. The disease was that this character had no weakness on the screen. And I think developers really have to spend a lot of time trying to find the disease instead of listening to people crying about the symptoms, you know? Oh, my head hurts. Uh, well, that could be a headache or a brain tumor. We have to really dig into it and find out what the problem is and make smart choices that will keep the entire ecosystem kind of in harmony. For me, KI kept getting better as the seasons went on. So I thought season one was a good enough game to buy a $400 console I didn't want to own. Season two, aside from some initial balance mistakes that they made, which they tried to correct quickly, I thought season two was really fun. And season three, for me, has gotten better because they've learned over the years what is good and what isn't good in the KI system, which is impossible to know when you first release the game. We can look back at KI season one and say, well, what a rookie mistake they made with this balance. But at the time, they had no idea how the game was going to play, right? So you need these years of experience to see the game in action, to see what's good, to see what's not good, to see how players play, like, oh, this move we thought would be not that great, it turns out it's amazing. And over the years, you learn these mistakes, and both Double Helix and Iron Galaxy have made their fair share of balance mistakes. And I think because Iron Galaxy was on the project, they just kept learning from them. And in the end, what we're left with at the end of season three now, where there's no more balance changes incoming, is a stable game that, for a game as wacky as KI, with so many subsystems and 29 characters that come from so many different genres of games and stuff, I think they did a pretty stand-up job with the end of balance. The Shadow Rock Storm like this. There it is. And then Chunk, you could be going Chunk. to sleep. Yeah, yeah there it that's went. what I was worried about. Community has always been at the core of Killer Instinct, both in its development and continued success today. If you ask a KI fan what are some of their favorite moments, some may say things like CD Junior's Evo win in 2014. This is going to be nearly impossible for Rico. This and he enough. went for the counterbreaker. CD Jr. is going to take it. Your Killer Instinct 2014 champion is Sadira. The many saucy sweets. Oh, 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 oh my god! <laughs> sweets come back against my god. Oh. Nice! I don't want to no, look. Leave it. I don't want to look. No! He got no. him! No! No way! Oh my god! 15 seconds on the clock! Shut up, Kevin! That didn't work! Sweet! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! Believe it! Impossible! <laughs> Domi's bomb loop. Right after it, and the flame won't come out. It'll Are we going to see it? Are we oh. going to see it? Oh, what? It's happening. What? It is happening. It's happening. What? Believe, what? believe. Oh. Can he cash it out? Can no, he get, he the crowd is going it. nuts. Oh, he go. got it. Oh. <laughs> well, Wheels' is loser's run at Combo Breaker 2017. It's not over yet. So he's got a grid in there. The bomb is going to chip him out. The bomb is chipped. Might have to backdash. That's going to be it. There's only four seconds left. What can Dane really do? Oh, oh no. Danger. He, he gets it. the ultimate. Dane and Jay. Clutching it out! It is not over yet! But most all will mention the Killer Instinct World Cup, a culmination of a community organized tournament circuit founded by Brandon Alexander and his business partner, David Rubin. The idea of the KI Cup came from obviously Capcom Cup. I felt like Capcom was doing a really great job representing their game, and it inspired me to, like, well, you know, it starts with the community. You gotta be the change that you wanna see. I was like, hey, Dave, let's put together this world tour. And he was like, you know what, let's, let's try it. You know, we didn't have a huge budget, but we could get a venue, maybe put ten to $20,000 up for a pop bonus, and then I'll just create a point system. That stuff was actually the easiest part. I figured it would be pretty tough, like putting together a point system that everyone would, would like and get on board with. But it got hard because we didn't really have a budget for, like, the world part of it, <laughs> you know? So I was like, hey, would you mind representing us, like, for, like, a KI World Cup qualifier? And people are like, well, well, what kind of funding are you going to bring in, you know, or et cetera. And it was like, oh, well, we don't really have funding. We just want to get people to your event and hopefully that helps. And the coolest thing about that is that people were like, so like, yeah, no, we, we'll, we'll help. We'll help you. So we weren't like this big entity. No, we're just like this little shop in San Antonio, Texas. When I announced that I was doing the KI Cup stuff, 
Adam reached out to me and was like, hey man, I'm doing all this stuff on KI now and I, I, want, I want to help you out however I can. The IG guys were the best. They wanted this to happen. So I had already been talking to Brandon Alexander a bit, just like on forums and on Twitter and stuff, because he was like this big super fan. He had a stream that I visited once in a while. And then he starts talking about, you know, oh, Microsoft's not doing a KI World Tour or World Cup. I'm just going to do it. I'm like, that sounds awesome, you know? I love community run stuff. I ran grassroots tournaments myself for a very long time. So I hit him up directly and I said, hey, why don't you send me your plans? Because I've actually done this before and I can give you some advice. So he sent me the plans. And I was like, this is a good start. And then I called Rick. And I was like, Rick, let's talk to him together. We'll see what we can do to amp this up a little bit, right? And I had not, I actually have never really spoken to Rick. We got on a phone call and Rick and I just like clicked. Like we clicked, dude. We, we, we had like the same vision for stuff and we cared about KI, the music, you know, it's just stuff we, we had a lot in common. And honestly, man, it was like love at first sight. <laughs> You know, Brandon's funding it, and he's got a bunch of great ideas, and I'm there just giving a little bit of guidance, but trying to stay out of it, because I'm on the dev, dev side. And, and Rick is in there just like really saying like, this is how we get that idea done. This is how we make this a reality. Once we started really getting going on season two and more tournaments were happening, I basically took on, I guess you could say, acting tournament director for Microsoft when it comes to Killer Instinct. We had done a fun, one of the things that was pretty unique about Killer Instinct was also the fact that it's DLC, which was the first like big character that was a boss in season one with Shadow Jago. And they wanted to make him like a real boy if people want to sort of pre-purchase him. The idea was that that funding was going to go directly into the Killer Instinct World Cup. So it was Microsoft sort of not directly managing the World Cup, but helping them out in some way while still funding the creation of a fighting game character that Iron Galaxy would have to make. I think within two to three days time, the character was completely funded. It hit their $100,000 requirement faster than I think anyone was expecting. Actually, funnily enough, I think we actually hit it sooner than that, but we were really afraid to announce that we hit it sooner than that because I think people <laughs> thought it was all fake, which it was not. <laughs> like, there was an insane passion from our fans for the characters. And I see patch notes from modern fighting games today and some of them make me just roll my eyes in how like almost hostile they are to the, the players, right? Whereas on Killer Instinct, our whole philosophy was let's bring everyone along, right? Like, let's explain our patch notes. Let's explain what we're doing with the characters. Here's the cool thing we're gonna do. How's this, blah. Because it's all for the community. And I think that when the Shadow Jago thing manifested of like, hey guys, this is what we're doing. We've been open with you this whole time. Here you go. And they're like, boop, <laughs> just did it. And then we definitely used some of that money. We put it towards Brandon's tour because we didn't know him at the time. And he was busy. He was just running. He was just going, I'm doing it. It's like, awesome. He loves this game. Like, look at how great our fans are. So let's put some money towards them and at least support the pots. And uh, I'm looking at the dates for, you know, season three gets signed behind the scenes. And I'm looking at the dates for all this stuff. And I'm like, we can demo season three at this. We could. Whereas the fake boy, though, Sh Sh Shadow Jago in season one was a fake boy. He was just Jago for the most part, but was a skin. That's what we mean. Like, Jago was, w wasn't a real boy at all. It was like, man, Shadow Jago looks so cool. It's unfortunate that he's just Jago, right? He's just Jago for the most part. He's a boss fight, and he had like one extra thing he did in the boss fight, but that was it. So that was the whole gimmick was that, oh, as the community, let's make this character a real boy. Let's actually give him budget to give him some moves, right? Let's give him some extra stuff because he wasn't... He clearly wasn't a character yet. Actually reveal the entire balance change live at this thing like we do in our studio, but in front of all the top players. So we went to Microsoft behind the scenes and we're like, will you guys be cool with us doing this? Like live in front of these people? <sighs> yeah, that was pretty nerve wracking going into that. And it's like, wait, wait, what's your agenda? Oh my God, that's, how long is that? You know, it's, it was pretty unbelievable. Not only that people would hang in there, but the fact that they would be able to be focused and go through it all like that. I mean, yeah, it's, that's an incredible amount of detail to have all in your heads, even with some of the scripts. It was bizarre to see that on the schedule. You're like, demo? What do you mean demo? And why is it taking three hours? They're like, yeah, we're going to show season three and show everything that you're getting go step by step. She has a new shadow move, actually. Oh. It's called Air Shadow on Reels On. She can perform the Air Shadow version of Air on Reels On. I don't think I can actually describe a moment of me being in a fighting game community 
that the Killer Instinct 2016 World Cup was. It was a stage presence where we're going to have the best players in the world jamming it out on season two of KI. But we're also going to have the developers to showcase all the new stuff that was going to be coming out in season three, have trailers and everything like that. The energy in the audience of showing people character to character what was going to be happening to their characters, how things were going to be changing, the new stuff that was going to be adding was just insane. It was cool seeing a packed house. Like, no one left. Everybody was there from beginning to end. Everybody was glued to the front. Nobody, nobody left. Everybody was just like, nah, we're going to sit here. We're going to listen to everything about what's going to happen. The other thing that's really cool about the way uh, Iron Galaxy and uh, Dave Lang, and then of course his, his team <laughs> do things, is it's like Johnny Carson's show, right? It's like they got the table and they're just talking through stuff and there's a little bit of comedy in there. And uh, you know, he had a captive audience, right? And he's like playing with their emotions and he's like razzing people a bit. Block us up close and then mash a light. Uh-oh. Mm. So. They're still really good, but you're gonna have to space them better. You can't no, just, that face is priceless. You can't just do it from it. up close. Keith, you're gonna have please. to do it from back here. That idea of showing the balance changes live to lots of people is... <laughs> Pink Diamond's reaction to the Maya nurse. Oh God. Oh God. So cool because seeing people in the crowd scream no when their characters get nerfed it filled me with such maniacal happiness right like i was just like oh it's so good and like seeing people like literally mouth agape at some changes was like super crazy as soon as you saw orchid you look over to the orchid gang they would be over there on the left side going like boo or like yeah that's good that's gonna work and the camera honed in on them it was just something else. It's something like I've never experienced before. And that's what I mean about like, the KI developers were very open to connecting with their audience. And sometimes that connection was like maybe overshared and maybe sometimes it led to stuff that they didn't want. But I think that moments like that probably justified doing it just because it was like, that's the kind of relationship you can have as developer and player that I don't think you can build any other way. Not to mention you got some of the biggest KI fans. Uh, K-Zero, who's one of the dudes that I know, he has one of the biggest Killer Instinct collections of all time. There were artists there. It was just, it was Killer Instinct headquarters in this small, tiny little ballroom in San Antonio. And that was like, to me, it's like the epitome of a fighting game community. It didn't feel too big where it was like an Evo kind of esports big spectacle that a lot of stuff has become. We were in this dingy little room in the middle of Texas. And it was absolutely just heartwarming because I felt like it felt like the arcade days. It felt like everyone's just here because of the thing they love. And I like that the Microsoft guys didn't try to make it super official. I'm like, I kind of appreciate the fact that they didn't, we have to go to the Microsoft Theater in LA, right next to where the Lakers play and Killer Instincts. KI never got that kind of attention. <laughs> it, it was always a game that was sort of subverted and literally grew up from its community alone because even between promotion, like commercials, Killer Instinct was never promoted a lot. It, it grew its brand just based on word of mouth. And you, f you felt that at its events, that everyone was there for KI. These people love this game just as much as me. I was very low budget, but with- <laughs> Matt, Esteban, what was that visual? <laughs> I wish I was there right now. That's E3, man. Today was E3. Oh my God, I'm getting sad again. Uh, the help of like the Tenno production crew and like Rick and stuff like that, we were able to make it look magical, like this little like arcade experience, like this own little expo. And I, I feel like the game really shined because you just saw the community in like its purest form. I've been really good friends with Brandon, and Brandon. He had like this idea where just like, yeah, you know, the World Cup's gonna be, I just want everyone to have fun and play KI. Literally, that was the basis of it. He just wanted everyone to play the game and be cool with it. The fact that KI World Cup blew up that big, especially the second year around, it was insane. Like, he, he didn't really know how to express how happy it was, and me neither, to be honest. It was cool seeing all these people show up just for the love of the game. And it's just, cause you gotta think about it. Like you're going to the World Cup, yeah, you know, there's only 32 people playing. But they have all these people come in, come through to watch and cheer on and stuff because they genuinely love the game. Killer Instinct was a game that seemed to have everything against it. A tight development cycle, launching on a new system with an untested seasonal model, the loss of their original developer, and the rapid transition to keep the project alive. And yet, it has endured to this very day. The title pushed the boundaries of what a fighting game could be, both in its gameplay and open dialogue between developers and fans. The last major update for Killer Instinct occurred in September 2017, and while currently there are no plans for a new entry in the series, it hasn't stopped players and fans from asking for Killer Instinct to return in some form. 
In July 2019, Maximilian uploaded a video with the hashtag BringBackKI with the hopes of garnering enough attention to the series that it would reach higher level Microsoft executives like Phil Spencer. The video and corresponding tweet exploded, becoming the epicenter for renewed interest in Killer Instinct. And with the switch to an online-only format in 2020 due to the ongoing global pandemic, Killer Instinct has once again become a featured game at EVO. What led Max to put together that video? And just what about Killer Instinct has led it to affect so many people? I'd say hashtag bring back AI was overwhelmingly successful, but was I expecting it to reach like number two or three world trending? No, I wanted to get a few hundred retweets to eventually get Phil at Microsoft to, to acknowledge that, oh, it's good to see KI fans, thumbs up, or something like that. Uh, the big thing that, that sparked me even doing that campaign was the fact that Banjo made it into Smash Brothers. If that happened, if we can get Banjo in Smash, then clearly we can get one of Microsoft's most fan-favorite franchises, which is KI, to at least be acknowledged in some way. The funny thing is that I never ended up hearing much from official Microsoft representatives regarding it, but the fact that it reached number two trending worldwide, the fact that it had so many retweets and mentions and just dominated Twitter for what felt like like two days straight, people give a shit. <laughs> like people really, really like KI. I just wanted to let the folks know at Microsoft how many people this game has affected. Not just me personally for the growth of my channel, which has obviously been huge, and for me as like a lifelong KI player, that this game like touched a lot of people in some way, uh, very deeply, where they, they truly love it, where it built communities, it, it fulfilled dreams, it did so many things that you want a fighting game to do to build a community. Like the whole thing with esports now is that everyone wants something to become an esport, but Killer Instinct did it perfectly, where we're just gonna prove that our game is great, we're just gonna let people play it, and the community is gonna grow as a result. And it's the literal definition of what a fighting game community is. And that carried it to the point of which it had 10 million downloads, where people, the word of mouth was good enough to sell KI better than marketing dollars ever could. And I think, especially with the, the Bring Back KI campaign, we were at least able, able to reach enough people that felt the same way I did, regardless if they were a competitor, regardless if they just played the game a few times and liked it, or played it a ton and liked it, or still played it, Everyone could resonate that, yeah, we'd like KI to come back at some point, and this is what I loved about Killer Instinct. The game motivated me to keep going at some point in my life, so I can imagine that did the same for other people. And the cool thing about KI as well is that the community was just amazing. Everybody that was a big leader helped in some way. There's just so many pillars of this community that did stuff for it, and it just encouraged people to play the game and, and, and to keep playing the game and to share the game because basically everybody just worked together. We were all on the same team and it, it felt that way. Just seeing how many people we've touched, like it's humbling as fuck. Like that was, you know, six plus years ago and people are still into it. Like that's that's awesome. It's it's amazing. And Killer Instinct 2013 gravitated towards a new player base. One, it was a new console. There was a lot of people getting into like fighting game esports and all that sort of stuff at that time. Also, it was bringing back a franchise that had been long dormant for such a long time, and it came back with such a big bang. It's like, yeah, it's hard not to remember that. The development of the game was really cool to watch. And I think that also is part of it, is just seeing the passion from the developers, seeing the passion from Microsoft, seeing the passion from the fans, and that all just fueled us to create something really special. I mean, looking back on it, it really comes down to wanting to build a game that we wanted to play and we wanted to play with other people. Working on Killer Instinct uh, was a dream of a lifetime. I made lifelong friends doing it. I hope I brought a lot of smiles for at least the little work that, that we were able to accomplish. I'm extremely happy that there was a season two and a season three and it was, it was done by developers that we know and we love. I couldn't have been more happy for the successes of KI, for what it's brought the fans, for what it's brought to me professionally and personally. We have a fighting game that's not like any other fighting game on the planet. We have a unique combo system. We have an interactive model that like no other fighting game touches. Like no one else does what KI does. There are only really a couple of fighting game developers in the world. And so when a game can come out and be as enjoyable as KI is and on so many levels, I think it scratches an itch that people might've been missing from some of the other fighting games because they've fallen into a rut of just playing those same games over and over again. Part of it is the fact that we did these seasons piled together. So anybody that ever tried Killer Instinct since 2013 
can pick it up today and see what's happened to it. And when you've been through that experience for a few years, especially as the core, that feeding of new, how do I react to this character? How do I react to that buff or this nerf? Once that stopped, you do get it, nothing new, this is it, you're done? Yes, for now. You never know if there'll be another KI, I would say, especially after the break and then another one comes. Is there a longer break? Is there a shorter break? Someday there has to be another killer instinct. But what are we doing this gen? We're shipping new hardware that's gonna play everything you can play now. We've stated publicly that the hardware you have. So I've got badass fight sticks. They will work on Series X. So I can just take my nice fight stick, plug it into Series X, download KI and play. So you kind of have a future-proof game. So my hope is anybody that watches this or anybody that cares, you just go on and continue to play Killer Instinct. I think people want to keep playing KI or see more KI because it is so unique in the fighting game space. It is a game based on two-way interactions where neither player is ever waiting for their turn and you're really always engaged in some sort of gamble or gambit or mind game with your opponent. It's just something other games aren't bringing to the table yet. And you couple that with like the cohesive sound design and the great net code and the way that it launched and just became this thing that a lot of people who didn't expect to play fighting games fell into. That is why the community is so cohesive and strong. I think we all have memories that are kind of inflated of our first competitive fighting game where we really got into it. And those aren't necessarily because of the game, they're because of the people. And I think there are a lot of people who are in love with what KI represents to them, not necessarily KI itself because this was their first competitive fighting game. This brought them into a whole new world. They've met all these people who they now consider close friends through the game. And any game can give you that, but KI did that for just such a massive number of people. Uh, and they, they just want to relive that, right? And uh, I think, unfortunately, that people who are in that part of the mindset really need a new game to relive that, right? They're not going to be satisfied by playing this one more or adding to this one. They really want to see a new game. But in my opinion, I think this version of KI is still super great. Toot my own horn. Super great, super brilliant. It's really underexplored. I think a lot of fighting game scientists can come in here and break the lid off a lot of things players never found. Play KI 2013. A lot of people said, I'm not going to play this game because you guys patch it too often and it updates too much. I'll come play when it's done. It's done. Come play. It's it was an interesting conversation I had with Keats recently how uh, we were talking about something that was in development for a new character. Something that they, they designed a... Uh, Really good. I'm going to give Keats a better, a better pause screen. Something that they, they designed specifically to be shadow countered. And uh, early in development, we were, we were fighting each other uh, with this new character b before they were out. And we were shadow countering it, like left and right. Like just whooping its ass. Um, when, the, when the game eventually came out, or the character eventually came out, nobody was shadow countering it. It's like... It's it's weird and he's, people still don't do it, right? Like they they like shadow counter as a mechanic fulfills so many issues that balance might might have in Killer Instinct. And Adam was like remember that like that we were we were playing these matches together and we thought everyone was going to shadow counter this. He's like nobody still does. It's 2020 and like people still don't shadow counter this thing. It's it's like it's like a clear weakness, but that's the thing about KI is that KI is a game where you have to make so many choices so fast and so frequently that sometimes you just are like, you're trying to gather your bearings instead of going for the thing that might be an obvious weakness. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the crazy part about KI's balance and what eventually, what eventually it became to be. Good. The netcode's better than everything else you're playing right now, probably, unless you're playing MK or Skullgirls or whatever. Uh, I think the character was Maya. Yeah, I think it was uh, several of Maya's normals hit twice. And the whole point was that when her normal hit twice, it's designed that way to be a good pressure move, but you shadow counter it. But people still, people still don't shadow counter Maya in that way, or never shadow countered her really in season two when she was the most powerful. They just didn't. And we, they, were, they, were, they just kept going, thinking like, oh, she's got this big weakness, right? People just never fucking did it. So yeah, just give it a try. You know, all you need is a small group of friends to learn with, and you're gonna have a blast. If a new KI comes out, sure. But if people really want to bring back KI, show up. 
That's all I ever wanted since season one. All these people always just like, I love KI, it's my favorite game. Then you go to a tournament, it's kind of like, kind of quiet. If you really, really want to bring back KI, please show it and love the game. Well, that was uh, that was an emotional roller coaster, right? For me, and being at like the being at this the epicenter of the fans of this game, and me essentially being like the champion, like the the fan, uh, like the fan champion of Ki. Uh, that shit was an emotional roller coaster. But it, it ultimately leads and reveals a lot of truths that I uh, I had thought to be true for a long time. You know, regarding regarding Killer Instinct and its development, regarding it being an Xbox Live Arcade game, uh, regarding the future of Ki, and um, and where it could possibly go. You know, and I think Ken explains it great in the end, and he explains it how. Um, Killer Instinct is designed to work on future hardware, right? The, the future of KI isn't a new game, at least from current Microsoft. It's just not. Uh, future KI is being able to play Killer Instinct the way the developers intended, uh, all the way on new hardware and in the future, right? 